Okay. Everybody hear me in the back? Good. We have two more minutes to go. Let's wait for other people. It's a small class scheduled into a big room. So you'll need to shout if you have questions in the back. Alternatively, everyone can come here and be cozy and nice. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> but th this room is not going to be full. <laughs> Looks like I've convinced two people. <laughs> That's good. Experiment a little bit. Right. Is this better? Without the lights on? Yeah? Okay. I felt it was too bright before. Okay, they tell me I don't need to do anything to start the recording. All the lectures will be recorded, so you don't have to be here. But it's better if you're here. <laughs> I'd prefer that than <laughs> nobody being here for sure. Uh, okay, let's get started. Hopefully you're here for computer architecture. Anybody not here for that? That's good, I don't see any hands raised. How many of you took digital circuits with me last semester? No one. That's good, actually. Or the ones who taken, who I know are registered on the list are not here yet. <laughs> that's good, because I'm gonna cover a lot of material that's gonna be similar to the first lecture of the digital circuits, so it'll be new to you, that's good. Uh, we're gonna talk about computer architecture. Uh, if you're expecting a lecture logistics today, we're not gonna cover that today. We may do that tomorrow, but instead I'm gonna talk about uh, what computer architecture I believe is about and what you will hopefully learn, what some of the exciting things hopefully we will discover in this course and study in this course in computer architecture. I believe it's a really exciting field today. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the field of computing, everybody is really trying to do design systems across the stack, not just the software, not just the hardware, but across the stack, both the software and the hardware. And this is a really good example of that, for example. I mean, even this is old right now, actually. They've introduced a new one. But if you look at that system, it's, it's designed from the ground up, if you will. They design the hardware, they design the instruction set architecture, they design the software on top of it, and they co-optimize. And computer architecture sits at the middle of all of that. It enables you to design systems like this, or data centers, or the machine learning chip that Google has, for example, which you may have heard of, the tensor processing unit, which essentially, and again, another example of uh, hardware software co-design. And this course at the heart of it is about hardware software co-design in the end and how to do that most efficiently. Okay, I'll start with a question. Since you have now taken digital circuits, you may not know what this is. How many of you know what this is? Yes. Exactly, yes, it's Bahnhof Stadelhofen. It's beautiful, right? I love this architecture. The first time I went there, I was really uh, amazed with the architecture over there. It was clear that it came out of the design of a really good architect. Do you guys know who that architect is? He was a fellow student some number of years ago at ETH. Well. It's really the first major piece of that architect. It's not the masterpiece, I would say. Uh, and you know the first answer, basically. This is interesting because the train station has several uh, of the features that became signatures of this architect's work. Straight lines and right angles are rare. It's really modeled like a bird, if you will. It looks 
looks like the bones of a bird, actually. So it's a very principled design, if you look at it. And the architect is, if no one is volunteering, so I will, <laughs> well, I still haven't given you much, <laughs> but it's really Santiago Calatrava, who was uh, a civil engineering student here. Actually, he did his PhD here. Uh, and he did a lot of other works in the future. Another question. Anybody know what this is? It's in New York, that's right. Have you been there? Inside? Oh, yeah, there you go. Inside, it's even more impressive than outside, perhaps, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. You, you were there during the times I was there. That <laughs> I saw it at that time, and I, I, I recently saw it, actually, this year as well. But this is called the Oculus. Uh, and it's a little bit more costly than Mann of Stadelhofen. <laughs> but it looks kind of similar in some sense, right? You see there are no right angles. It looks like a bird again. And again, uh, the design of this person, this, uh, yeah, Calatrava. And you can read this, basically. Calatrava said the Oculus resembles a bird being released from a child's hand. The roof was originally designed to mechanically open to increase light and ventilation to the enclosed space, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you can read the Wikipedia page. But basically, this is a principle that keeps repeating. I can show you all of the designs of this architect. If you're interested, you can watch my lecture for digital circuits because we covered more of these works. I'm going to condense it more in this course because this is really the early materials. But this is really a principled design. Uh, and let's see, what, what do I want to point out over here, basically? Uh, the, uh, the design for the world, this is actually the World Trade Center path station. It was, it's really a metro station also over there. But you keep walking and walking. So you just, it's, it's really an art building as well. But basically, over the years, uh, Santiago Calatrava's design uh, should satisfy those who believe that buildings planned for ground zero must aspire to a spiritual dimension. Over the years, many people have discerned a metaphysical element in Calatrava's work. I hope New Yorkers will detect its presence too. Blah, blah, blah. It's a pleasure to report for once that public officials are not overstating the case when they describe a design as breathtaking. Of course, this comes at a cost, and we will see the cost also. It's about $4 billion in the end, which is a lot. Okay. Uh, so this is a principle design. We'll talk about principles a lot in this course, but I just want to motivate you right now. But anything, any design in the end comes with design constraints. And even this beautiful design came with some design constraints. If you read the Wikipedia page, there is a quote saying that Calatrava's original soaring spike design was scaled back because of security issues. They were too big, I guess. I don't know. They don't uh, detail it. but. And somebody uh, mocked it, saying, in the name of security, Santiago Calatrava's bird has grown a beak. Uh, its ribs have doubled in number, and its wings have lost their interstices of glass. Uh, the main transit hall between Church and Greenwich streets will almost certainly lose some of its delicate quality while gaining structural expressiveness. It may now evoke a slender stegosaurus more than it does a bird. I find this funny, because even the existing design is beautiful. And if you don't know what a stegosaurus is, it looks like this. I think it looks more like a bird. <laughs> but basically, you can see that people are evaluating the architecture, right? We will do a lot of that evaluation of the real architecture as well. I don't know where that bird went. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this looks nice, too. It's not too bad, right? Maybe for $8 billion, it would have been a real bird. <laughs> OK, but this is really a design constraint, right? And security is one design constraint that real architects have to deal with but computing architects also have to deal with as well. And then there are more design constraints. As you can see, the design was further modified in 2008 to eliminate the opening and closing roof mechanism because of budget and space constraints. That's exactly what we have in engineering also. It doesn't change. But architecture and computer architecture are also very similar. And later, the transportation hub has been dubbed the world's most expensive transportation hub for its massive cost for reconstruction. Well, almost $4 billion. So there's a trade-off between a good architecture and costs. And a good architect balances all of these different trade-offs in the end. Let me ask you another question. Anybody know what this is? No. Say it again. Bill Gates what? 
his home? Oh, he would probably like it to be his home. <laughs> I would like it to be my home, yes. <laughs> That's a good guess, but no, I don't think so. Unless he recently bought it. <laughs> this is something closer to my heart, because I used to be at Carnegie Mellon University before I joined ETH. And this is close to there. But this is another view of it. This, I believe, is actually a better view, because it shows how this building melds with the uh, water that's falling, flowing underneath. If you can see this cantilever, it's resembled by this one, another cantilever that's resembled by this one. So it's really designed to imitate the surroundings that it's placed on top of, actually. And then another principle design, a different principle, but again, a principle design. And this is, it turns out, it's the masterpiece of another famous architect. Some would argue that he's much, much more famous than Calatrava, although Calatrava is gaining in fame. Anybody know who he is? I guess not. Well, first of all, this is falling water. And the architect is this guy. He is Frank Lloyd Wright. He's, uh, actually, this falling water is taught in architecture classes. If you go to Architecture 101, uh, I will bet you that you will see the picture of <laughs> falling water in the class. But basically, this is uh, mm, one, of the, one of the most beautiful buildings uh, that was designed in the, in the last century. And you can read about it. I'm not going to go over this over here. Somebody named it. Amer American Institute of Architects named the house best of all time work of an American architecture in 2007. But it's very close to where I used to teach. That's why I know it. The good thing is now I have, at ETH, I have another architect where I can talk about. Imagine how terrible it would be if, if I went to a place where I, I couldn't find that architect. Anyway, that's a joke. <laughs> so your first assignment in this course and uh, is to go and visit Bahnhof Stadelhofen. How many of you have been there? Okay. I was expecting more, but that's good. Now, you, now other people have a reason, but people who have already been there have a, another reason to appreciate the beauty. And extra credit repeat for Oculus. It's a little bit longer. And extra plus credit repeat for falling water. <laughs> falling water is a little bit out of the way. Uh, but if you're driving around northeastern United States, you can get to it. And I would uh, uh, ask you to appreciate the beauty and out-of-the-box and creative thinking, which is really important in the design of computer architectures as well, uh, while you're visiting it. And thinking about the trade-offs in, in the design of the uh, Bahnhof and the other places you may actually visit. Because there are a lot of trade-offs. There are a lot of strengths, weaknesses, goals of the design, things that may have been accomplished, things that may not have been accomplished, as we've seen with Oculus, right? The design always is something the initial design is something very different from the final design. That's true for the architectures we design in computer systems as well. Actually, I, I would put another example over here, which is the Sydney Opera House. Sydney Opera House. How many of you have been to the Sydney Opera House? It's in Australia. One, two, okay, good, three. No? <laughs> now you'll have to go. <laughs> Basically, that's another beautiful building, and that uh, when the architect, so Sydney uh, opened up a competition to build something the, uh, for, for, uh, for the opera house, and when the architect first sketched it through, people said, it's impossible to design. It was a feat of engineering to design that building. If you go there, you'll be amazed. But that's another, again, is it, is it really what the architect imagined in the beginning? Is the final result the same? Well, goals of the design might be different from what comes at the end. And I would, uh, I would ask you to derive principles on your own for good design and innovation by examining these different architectures, hopefully building upon what you've actually seen in this course, applying what you've learned in this course. It's, it's always good to, uh, to think about these different fields. Uh, okay. So I think my, um, one of my takeaways over here is uh, these designs are, in my opinion, are very creative and out of the box. And thinking out of the box is really necessary to build systems that make a difference today, especially in computing. And hopefully I'll talk about some examples of why that is the case today. OK, let's look at uh, some differences. Let's build on this a little bit more. I like playing this game, find the differences of this and that. Have you ever played this game? Having two pictures and try to find the differences? You probably have. <laughs> Well, this is not going to be <laughs> maybe that fun, but it's going to be more obvious. This is my this over here, Stadelhofen, and this is that. 
a decent bar of probably eight. It's not bad. It's usable. But it's clearly not this. <laughs> so there are many trade-offs between the designs. You can list them after you complete the first assignment. This is meant to be, uh, uh, it's not meant to be a real assignment at the moment, but let's look at some of the evaluation criteria. So whenever you're looking at two different architectures, you need evaluation criteria to decide which one is better or, uh, yeah, which one is better essentially, right? And this is true for computer architectures as well. So whatever I put over here <laughs> is true for a computer system that you design. Functionality, does it meet the specification? You wanted to design it in one way, uh, did it actually meet that? Reliability, is it reliable or is it gonna collapse tomorrow? Space requirement, cost, is it $4 billion or $100 million? Expandability, can you actually expand it? Uh, comfort level of users, that's very important in today's architectures, right? Happiness, aesthetics, dot, dot, dot. You can add more over here, of course. So how to evaluate goodness of design is always a critical question, and we will struggle with it in this course. We'll talk about performance, we'll talk about power, energy consumption, we'll talk a lot about reliability. Today, hopefully, we'll talk about security. And today, we're getting into systems that are so small in the future size, transistors that are so small that all of these different requirements start interacting. Whatever you do to performance affects energy, and that may affect reliability, and that may affect security in the end. So these things are becoming intermingled today. So a good architect really needs to know a lot of these things at the same time if you want to design a good system. That's why Apple pays a lot to its architects, by the way, and <laughs> they're very careful in hiring uh, people. And that's true for other places also. Okay, so a key question is, how was, in this case, Calatrava able to design especially his key buildings? Any, any guesses? What, what is it that made him that architect that designed these things? Was he hardworking? Was he extremely creative? Was he just dedicated? I don't know, you could argue. Was he just well-funded? <laughs> but how did he get started if he was less well-funded? <laughs> Clearly, well, he was very well-funded, right, and for, the, for his last masterpiece project. And you need funding to uh, uh, enable things as well. You can have many guesses. Well, <laughs> these are my <laughs> set of guesses. Clearly, that was true. I think all of, the, I think all of, all of uh, these were true to some extent. Uh, it's, it's very hard to, you can ask him probably. But certainly, all of these helped. I like this dollar sign over here. <laughs> Luck was important also. He was probably lucky to get his first assignment, right, Stadelhofen, and after that, he was able to build more. Uh, I, will, uh, I think you will be exposed to a lot of these things and hopefully develop and enhance many of these skills in this course, at least that's how I would like to think about it. Uh, being an architect, uh, computer architect, is very similar to being a real architect, in my opinion, and you will need many of these. Principal design is something I'm going to single out. I think that's really important. Uh, if you actually care about some of the principles, you can actually achieve something much, much bigger and much better than what others who are not principled can achieve. Uh, and I think the second one that I will point, point out is strong understanding of and commitment to fundamentals. So that's why this course will build upon a lot of fundamentals and uh, providing a strong understanding of those fundamentals as well as principles. Sorry, I cannot you provide you funding yet. But if you have a really good idea, <laughs> I'd be happy to consider it. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're actually thinking about a startup and you convince me that it's a really good idea. <laughs> and luck is something you can ac actually yourself uh, can, can harness, in my opinion. We'll, we'll come to that later on. Okay. And a good understanding of past design. I think it's, a, it's also important. We'll talk a lot about these like ideas, different ideas, and trying to understand them. Uh, based on a principled evaluation framework. I think those are really important. And I will ask you to work hard. Is anybody afraid of that? Not yet. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so principled design. Let's uh, look at the principled design in the context of uh, Kalat Java's work. Basically, he says, uh, according to me, there are two overriding principles to, to be found in nature which are most appropriate for building. One is the optimal use of material, and the other, the capacity of organisms to change shape, to grow, and to move. And he actually envisioned that for Oculus, right? The, the top would open, but he wasn't able to achieve that in the final design because he, 
he didn't get enough funding. Somebody said you cannot do it. Well, here's another building, actually, which I should have put over here, but I just forgot. Uh, the, the building for uh, Florida Atlantic University, I believe, that actually opens at the top. He was able to get funding. It's like a, it's like a little B or something that has, uh, that's able to open. So he was able to realize uh, this, this capacity in real buildings as well. Okay, and it's inspired by natural forms like plants, bird wings, and the human body. This is another example of his buildings. I should have put the other one too before this. But this is in Lisbon. Has anyone gone there? You've seen this? Okay, yeah, this is a very famous one. I'm not, I've never been there, but it's, I know that it's very famous. It's very beautiful. And do you know what it's modeled after? Well, I'm going to overlay something on top of this. <laughs> it's like humans or whatever you consider these things are, <laughs> holding <laughs> something big. <laughs> yeah, and you can read. This is his this is own uh, sketch, I believe. So it's basically, that's an that's, that's example of principle in action, right, over here. So my homework is to go there, actually. And I will hopefully go there before the end of the year. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, called zoomorphic architecture, and his work is one of the most uh, important pieces of this. Uh, zoomorphic architecture examples of this. Basically, I, I'm, I'm not going to go over this again, but basically it's the practice of using animal forms as the inspirational basis and blueprint for architectural design. Now you can try to do a computer system like this also, maybe, but <laughs> I'm not sure. You'll need to justify it well. But the key takeaway is the principle is what's important here. That principle has enabled a lot of success. And you can see some other examples of this. Okay, and this reminds me of a bird. It may remind you of a dinosaur. Certainly a critic said it was like a dinosaur at the end, but, <laughs> but you'll always have critics also, right? That's... Okay, so this is another quote from the other famous architect that we've seen, Frank Lloyd Wright. He actually explicitly said, we should be designing architectures based upon principle and not upon precedent. And that's, that's more, uh, more, uh, more true today for computing systems as well. Uh, than in the past, actually. And hopefully I'll give you some examples of that. So precedent is always good to know, but you should make the designs much more principled. Okay, so if, if Frank Lloyd Wright was doing yet another house in nature, maybe he would have done this. This is the precedent. But he didn't. Instead, he designed something like this because he had a principled design, right? He had his own principles. And his principle was organic architecture, basically. Uh, which promotes harmony between human habitation and the natural world through the design approaches so sympathetic and well integrated with its site that buildings, furnishings, and surroundings become part of a unified interrelated composition. It's a bunch of big words, but uh, an example is falling water. It, it, as, I, as I showed you earlier, uh, this integrates well. It's really on top of a, a waterfall. And it was actually a challenge to put it on top of the waterfall over here and keep it there for... I don't know how many years right now, maybe 40 years, 50 years, or longer. Uh, but basically, um, and also it's, uh, it, it's harmonious with uh, its surroundings, because if you look at this uh, waterfall, it has uh, one piece over here, another piece over here, and this is meant to imitate that. And you cannot actually see the bottom, which it's, it's beautiful, basically. OK, these are other pictures. So let me come to the high-level goals of the course. I can go on and on and on with some of these principled architecture designs, but we'll talk about computing architectures, which uh, we should get inspiration from the architects as well. But basically, we'd like to understand the principles in this course. Uh, that's one of the major goals, actually. What are the principles that are driving the designs of good systems, not bad systems? But we'll also see examples from systems that may have failed or that may not have been as, as successful. Understand the precedents, that's also important. What has been done before, it's actually really critical to understand that. And based on such understanding, hopefully it will enable you to evaluate the trade-offs of different designs and ideas, so that when you look at a design, you can say, oh, this are, these are the strengths, these are the weaknesses, and these are how I can improve it. And enable you to develop principal designs, and enable you, hopefully, to develop novel out-of-the-box designs that can change the future. So maybe instead of Google designing their tensor processing unit, you can design a much, much better, much, much more novel, much thing that you can actually enable the processing of something much bigger 
than what Google can do. There's a challenge for you. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get the funding also. <laughs> okay, so the focus is on, again, principles, presence, and how to use them for new designs. The focus of co is on computer architecture. I'm not gonna talk about buildings as much in the later parts of this, lec uh, this lecture or uh, the course. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what, it, what the role of an architect is since it's a computer architecture course. Uh, anybody know this guy? No one? Well, I know some of you. The TAs, some of the TAs know, but not, <laughs> not everybody who's taking this course. Uh, but this is my PhD advisor, actually, Yale Pat. Uh, he's a famous guy in the field. Uh, does anybody know about branch prediction? Okay, if you've taken my course, you should know about it. Who doesn't know about it? Don't be shy. I'd like to get a gauge of. Okay, there, there, there are multiple people, so we'll talk about that, hopefully. Um, but basically, he's uh, designed branch prediction algorithms that went into all of the microprocessors of today in, uh, in early 1990s. And then Pentium Pro was the first processor that actually implemented his branch prediction algorithms. The branch prediction, basically, if you get a branch instruction, and if you have a pipeline machine, you don't know what to fetch next, right? You don't even know that, that what you've gotten is a branch instruction. So how do you figure out, how do you keep the pipeline full in the presence of this branch instruction that says you should either go this way or this way, but you don't know where to go? So you guess. And Processors implement very sophisticated algorithms today to make sure that that guess is really good. In fact, in some of the workloads, in many of the workloads, the prediction accuracy is more than 90%. If, in fact, 90% is even bad, considered bad today. When we get to those lectures, you will see that. Uh, but basically, he, uh, his group has, implement, uh, has designed those algorithms. But okay, let's, let's get back uh, to the topic. So what's the role of the architect, according to Yale Pat? Well, you'll need to do everything, basically. <laughs> you need to have eyes everywhere. <laughs> you need to look backward. You need to examine old code, understand what's happened before. You need to look forward. Forward meaning you need to anticipate the applications that are coming into the future. So dreamers. For example, people who were doing deep neural networks in 1970s. They were dreamers, perhaps, right? And they, that work had very little impact until now when the computational power of architectures has enabled them, right? Now, if you look everywhere, everybody is about deep neural networks. It's almost become a pad. But that's, that's essentially dreaming, right? Someone can tell, come up with a really dreaming idea and say, okay, I want this really complicated computation, and that will enable a lot of things, and maybe you'll have architectures that enable those things if you actually listen to the dreamers. And look up nature of the problems. I think this is a similar uh, to the forward, and look down, understand the technology as well. I actually have another slide that talks about this in a little bit more detail. What does look backward mean? Understand the trade-offs and designs, upsides and downsides, past workloads, analyze and evaluate the past, basically. And this is an important thing a lot of architects do, and you will learn to do that also in this course. Looking forward, again, create new designs, listen to the dreamers who have new ideas. Don't say no, necessarily. It's easy to say no, actually, for many, many reasons, right? But actually, those are the, 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 the people who dream new architectures and new applications are the ones who can enable them if you actually look forward. Okay. Look up, understand the important problems and their nature, basically. What's an important problem to solve? And develop architectures and ideas to solve important problems. And look down. This is also very important because what, you're, what you can actually design is limited by the capabilities of the underlying technology. And we will see that later with the examples that I'm going to give in this course. For example, you may have uh, an architecture that exploits carbon nanotubes really well, right? But if carbon nanotubes are not possible, are not able to do some things, then you have a mismatch, right? You may have an, uh, an architecture that requires uh, massive, massive amounts of DRAM, dynamic random access memory. But dynamic random access memory may not be able to scale to those massive capacities, right? So again, you need to understand the underlying technology, uh, what, what devices and circuits are capable of. If you want to clock, uh, for example, a circuit at 100 gigahertz, and if the circuit is not capable of it, then you should probably not design an architecture that requires a 100 gigahertz circuit, right? So you really need to understand the lower level. 
And also underlying technology in terms of uh, substrates as well. For example, what, what, is, what is an FPGA, a field programmable gateway, capable of? How many operations can it do? If your architecture doesn't fit well in there, then you, you run into problems, right? And also, I think predicting and adapting to the future of technology is important because you're always designing for n years ahead. You're never designing for today, right? If you're designing for today, you're already too late because somebody already designed for today before you did. So you really need to enable the future technology. And to be able to do that, you really need to understand. So one of the things that we will talk about in this course is emerging technologies. Uh, one especially in the memory side today, there are a bunch of emerging technologies that could actually change the way things are done. Uh, and these emerging technologies are non-volatile. So imagine uh, an emerging technology like phase change memory that's almost as fast as DRAM, but it's non-volatile. So everything can be persistent in the system. Of course, this is a dream again, right? Maybe it's not that easy to do. Uh, I think one of my favorite examples of this over here, actually, which we will also hopefully talk about, is flash memory. Uh, right? You guys are probably young. Uh, you, you, you were born with flash memory, I assume, right? No? <laughs> Maybe, OK. <laughs> Close enough. But flash memory was, not a, was an emerging technology when people were developing it two decades ago, or three decades ago. It really became popular in the 2000s, right? But it did really uh, revolutionize systems. Things are not as slow anymore. Like we used to deal with really slow systems, but the SSDs actually changed that slowness. So that's, example, that's an example of an emerging technology that is not emerging anymore, that's really mainstream, and that's there. And everybody used it. And people who have actually enabled it and built upon it actually did a great service to everyone, and they also probably became rich at the same time. That's, that's the benefit, I assume. <laughs> okay. Okay, so some takeaways. Uh, I think being an architect is not easy. It's very fulfilling, but it's not easy because you'll need to, at least a good architect, you'll need to do a lot of these things at the same time, right? Uh, you need to consider many things in designing a new system and have good intuition and insight into the ideas and trade-offs. Again, you're designing for, let's say, three years ahead, five years ahead, maybe 10 years ahead, right? Some systems that are deployed are being run for 20 years or so, right? Like if you're an architect of a satellite, for example, you've designed the processor over there and it's going to be there for, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years. How do you architect that? That's a very specialized architecture, of course. But there are architects designing those systems also. Right? These things, like my computer is already five years old. And even at the time when I bought it, it was not the state of the art. <laughs> right? So you need to really uh, have a good prediction capability, intuition, and ideas. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I consider computer architecture not a perfect science, but it's really an art, just like real architecture is. Real architecture has the same problem because you're designing something, and you cannot model everything in the end. You cannot model how people will perceive it. That might be a really undecidable problem. That may be one of the most difficult things, right? You, you really need a deep neural network to figure out, perhaps, how to do that. So you really need to, be, uh, to exercise art in this case. But it is fun and can be technically very, very rewarding. And I think it enables a great future. That's why I'm doing it. Basically, many scientific and everyday life innovations would not have been possible without architectural innovation that enabled very high performance systems today. Deep neural networks is a perfect example today. I wouldn't have been able to give that example three or four years ago, but today I can say with confidence that that's one of the examples that has been enabled because of these high performance architectures that we have. Well, another one's your mobile phones, right? Because everyone carries it today. And this course will hopefully teach you how to become a good computer architect. I hope you guys are here for that. Cool. OK, so I hope you're here for this also. <laughs> Basically, I'll put the course in context. Uh, how many of you have taken systems programming? Here. OK, good. So in systems programming, hopefully you did C. Yes, perfect. C is a good language. I love it <laughs> because it, it exposes you to things. Did you like C? <laughs> OK, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's not as easy as some other languages, but. It's, it gets you down to a closer level. Basically, you got a programmer's view of how a computer system works. How many of you took digital design? OK. Who has never taken digital design? 
okay, who's never taken systems programming or system software, operating systems. Okay, okay. You guys may need to brush up on some things, but hopefully this will come together. At the bottom, you have digital logic as a model of computation. You've learned how basically gates can be constructed and they can be controlled so that you can do computation, right? And this is really the hardware designer's view of how a computer system works, right? It's really the bottom-up view. This is a top-down view. You have actually some programs and they somehow run. And here you have some logic and they somehow operate. Well, you know how they, they somehow operate, but you never really go to the very, very high level. So what happens in between? <laughs> That's really the subject of this course. You may have been exposed, if, if, you, if you took actually uh, digital circuits with me, you were exposed a lot to what happens in between. Uh, and you were exposed in some of these courses also, probably. How does an assembly program end up as de executing gates and digital logic? And also at the lower level, how is a computer designed using logic gates and wires to satisfy specific goals? That's what in between is all about. And that's what computer architecture is, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we'll later distinguish between architecture and microarchitecture, uh, but let's put them together right now. Uh, an architect's view is how to design a computer system that meets the system design goals that you have. That's called a design point also. For example, Carl Java's design point was affected by security costs, right? You need to meet those goals. And the choices you make at this level, at this in-between level, critically affect both who's up and who's down. <laughs> you can make a choice that, that ensures that the programmers go crazy, <laughs> but makes the life of the uh, hardware designer simple, or you could make the opposite choice. I can give you one example, multi-core systems, for example. You can design a very simple core processor that's incapable of executing any interesting program fast, but you can put 10,000 of them on a chip, let's say. Now that's easy for the hardware designer because they don't need to do much, right? <laughs> they can just use a single cycle processor, maybe. But then that makes the programmer go crazy because how are they going to get performance out of this machine? They need to program it in parallel, right? And that's, we know that that's not an easy thing at the moment. Or alternatively, you can actually design a, uh, design a sing uh, single threaded processor that's extremely fast, perhaps extremely complex, but that's extremely good at executing serial code. The program, whatever the programmer dumps at the computer, very unoptimized code, serial, not, nothing parallel in it, the, pro, uh, the, 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 the computer can execute it fast. Now that's a great choice for the programmer, because programmer really doesn't need to do anything, and most programmers don't want to do anything in the end. It's not, it's not the fact that they don't want to do anything, but it's really already, it's, it's already difficult to program and get the programs right. Software is actually very complex in the end. And if you want to add features, if you want to ensure that it satisfies a purpose, you don't want to worry about, in the end, how do you actually get performance out of it. Performance, therefore, is a secondary concern for most programmers. Functionality is the first one. And that's the nature of things, in my opinion. That's very hard to change. That's human nature. If you want to go a little bit deeper, understand how you actually optimize something, most people tend to shy away from that. But that's a very great choice for a programmer. Now it makes the hardware designer go crazy, right? And the architect as well. <laughs> how do you actually design this system that can run any single thread program extremely fast and efficiently? So these are two extremes of a single choice, right? And you can now think about other potential choices, right? How do you store the data? Whose responsibility is it? How do you punt on the programmer? Do you punt on the programmer or do you store the data automatically and ensure reliability guarantees? Or do you expose reliability problems to the programmer? The programmer says, oh, this should be reliable, this should not be reliable. So you have a huge, amount, a huge space of optimization and different design choices, and the choice critically affects both the top and the bottom. That's one of the reasons why this is really exciting, because you're able to change uh, the, uh, the trade-offs over here. Okay, and we'll cover a lot of this, actually, uh, in this course. Everything I cover, I will talk about, hopefully, the, the, uh, the, the upsides and downsides of the uh, design choices for these different people. Okay, this brings us to the levels of transformation. How many of you know it? Okay, this shows that you haven't taken my course. That's fine. <laughs> 
Uh, how many of you know Richard Hamming? Hamming codes. Right. Yes, some people. <laughs> okay, this is probably a good place to ask you some questions. Like, uh, are most of you bachelors or master's students? I guess who are bachelor students here? No one? Master's students? Okay. PhD students? Okay. I saw a bunch of bachelor students registered also, maybe. Maybe they, they, they were not able to figure out where the class is, but that's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, or maybe, maybe they know, actually, that these courses are going to be recorded. But it's better to be here, frankly. I would encourage you to be here. It's better than, uh, better than watching the lectures, because when you watch the lectures, you're not able to ask questions and interact with me uh, the same way. And I cannot guarantee that the lecture will be available, because who knows, maybe there's some reliability problem with this thing over there. <laughs> OK, so Hamming uh, is a famous computer scientist uh, for error correcting codes, especially Hamming codes. And this is what he said. Basically, the purpose of computing is to gain insight. In the end, that's our goal. That's why we're doing, I'm, I'm picking on deep neural networks today, but that's why we're doing deep neural networks, right? We want to gain insight into some problem that we're trying to solve. Is this a cat or a dog? Even that's insightful. <laughs> you want to distinguish. That's a simple classification problem, right? But you want to do even more, right? You want the computer to understand you and do something for you. But in the end, the goal is to enable something insightful and useful. And this is Hamming, and it's, even at the time, he, he had a cat over there. And probably the computer wasn't able to recognize that there was a cat over there. But today, they do. So we gain and generate insight by solving problems. So how do we ensure problems are solved by electrons? That's where uh, this transformation hierarchy, or levels of transformation, comes in. We have a problem. You need to translate it to electron language. Right. Now, that doesn't happen because you cannot directly speak to electrons. That would be nice, actually. Maybe, maybe that's the dream, right? Enable you to speak in human language, and the electron understands and moves left and right. right. Maybe with quantum computing. <laughs> we'll get there. OK, but you, today, uh, people have built levels of abstraction to actually enable this. You translate the problem to an algorithm. An algorithm, hopefully you know. Have you covered algorithms in a previous course? Yes? OK, so you probably know. I'm not going to ask you right now, but you should know that it's a step-by-step -step procedure that has three properties. It's guaranteed to terminate. This is called finite finiteness. Each step is precisely stated. This is called definiteness. And each step can be carried out by a computer. It's called effective computability. You need these three things. For, a prop, for, for an algorithm to be execut executable in a computer, right? And many algorithms, there could be many algorithms for the same problem, right? And I'm not going to go over this in detail uh, at the moment. If, if uh, You can probably review uh, the works. But basically, once you translate it into the algorithm, after that you need to pr uh, translate it into a language that the computer, uh, that you can write in, and that can be translated into the language that the computer can understand. So this program or language runs on a runtime system. Runtime system consists of many components. Operating system is one example. But virtual machine is part of the runtime system also. There's memory management that goes on. These are all intermingled. And eventually, the program gets translated into an instruction set architecture, at least in general purpose systems today. Uh, and this instruction set architecture is the interface or contract between the software and the hardware. Basically, this is what the software programmer assumes that the hardware will satisfy. An add instruction, for example, does this, and the software programmer will assume that it will satisfy that. And this ISA gets implemented by the microarchitecture. It's basically an implementation of the ISA. And microarchitecture gets implemented using logic gates, digital logic circuits. These are the building blocks of the microarchitecture. And they get implemented on top of some phys physical devices, right? transistors, or transistors of different kind or something else, right? You could implement them with mechanical switches as well, right? That's another device. That's why we have this distinction. Logic can be implemented on mechanical switches as well, except it'll be terribly slow, probably, and maybe not reliable. OK, so this is the levels of transformation. If you want more information about this, you should definitely watch my lectures in digital circuits. We're not going to focus uh, on the different components over here. 
but uh, basically architecture sits in between. And this is, again, as I, uh, I mentioned, that this is a general purpose system. ISA, for example, it may not exist in some systems, right? If you're working on reconfigurable computing, for example, if you have field programmable gate array, you directly translate a design that you have and you bake it onto the system, right? Basically, you go from, directly from the program level into the microarchitecture and logic levels. Right? There is no ISA in between. There is no instruction that gets executed on an FPGA. You directly put the logic circuits by translating the uh, program on there, right? Now, you could use the FPGA substrate, if you've taken digital circuits, that's what you've done, to actually imitate a computer, right? You could actually put the circuits and have an interface, the ISA interface, and the circuits will actually execute those instructions, right? Now, this already gives you the richness of computer architecture. You can do many, many things. Really, you're really bound by your imagination and the funding in the end and the cost. So one of the things that I would like to encourage you in this course is to think critically. So even this picture over here is not true for all computer architectures that we have today. General purpose computer architecture is absolutely true, but not all computer architectures. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you an aside, basically. Well, I'll give you a lot of asides in this course, because I think education is much more than just a course, but it's really understanding the bigger context. Uh, Hamming actually uh, got the Turing Award for this work. Turing Award is the most prestigious award in computer science. Uh, every year, one person wins it. And Hamming got it, I don't know which year, but he got it for basically error detecting and error correcting codes, mainly in, uh, starting from the paper that he wrote in 1950. And this introduced the concept of Hamming distance. How many of you guys know Hamming distance? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> where did you learn Hamming distance, by the way? I'm, I'm new, so I want to understand the, <laughs> where you learned the concept and the course structure. Anybody? You just read about it yourself? Okay, that's great, yeah, theoretical. Uh, that, that, that makes sense. Because if you didn't learn it there, I would teach it over here. <laughs> But basically, I guess I'll teach it anyway, because some of you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> it's basically the number of locations in which the corresponding symbols of two equal length strings are different. It's, so if you have two equal length strings, like four, four length strings. Oh, what is it? I, I'm blanking out. Uh, in the cat and dog. <laughs> Those are equal length strings, according to the Latin alphabet. Three characters, what is the Hamming distance between them? Three, right? <laughs> because they are different in every character. C, A, T, D, O, G, right? Okay, so, but based on this simple Hamming distance insight, he developed a theory of codes that is used for error correction and detection. Uh, and actually, a lot of Hamming codes are used in error correcting. For example, I talk about flash memory. Flash memory applies a lot of error correction to the data that's stored uh, in, uh, inside the memory itself. And a lot of the concepts are based on this Hamming distance in the end. I'm not going to go over it, uh, in detail into the theory of that. If we eventually design a dependable computing course, we can go into the details. But uh, it's, it's, it's good for you to know what these things are used for. And also, Hamming wrote this, uh, actually gave this talk, you and your research. How many of you are doing research in computer science or E or anything? One, two. How many of you intend to do research at some point? Okay. How many, how many of you don't know whether you want to do research? Okay. <laughs> how many of you know that you will never do research? <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. That's excellent also. <laughs> well, maybe you'll do research as part of this course and you, don't, you won't know. <laughs> okay. So, but he gave this really beautiful talk about you and your research where he actually gives uh, his principles on how to do the research in the best way. And I would, if you're ever considering doing or not doing research, regardless, I would definitely recommend that you read this, because this is really instructive. He gave this talk in 1986, about the time he was retiring, or maybe he was already retired from Bell Labs. And it was a retrospective on his career, describing, oh, what did I do right, what did I do wrong? And it was an advice to future researchers who were starting at that time. You can find the video of it also. Uh, I'm not sure how good the quality of the video is, but 
definitely I can read uh, the text. It's beautiful. This is actually what I would recommend, uh, what I recommend to all of my PhD students and all of my advisees to start. But I think it's very generally useful as well. Okay, let's revisit the uh, levels of transformation. Uh, this is another uh, view of the levels of transformation, and we'll take a break after that. Uh, basically, you can take another issue with uh, the levels of transformation that I showed earlier. It, it doesn't have the user in it, right? But today, most computing systems are designed for users. Users interact with these systems, right? And users, different users interact at different points, right? Some users actually interact with specifying the algorithms, programming. Some users interact with the microarchitecture. And some, uh, some of those users are programmers. Some of, them, some of those users are real users of the sy system. So when you're a computer, computing architect, you're really designing the system for many, many different users, if you think about it. It's the programmer. It's the system software programmer. It's the maintainer of a data center, let's say. It's the person who is really interacting with this thing, a regular user. right? Then you, you, you need to satisfy all of them, in a sense. So it's the, the trade-off is actually even more complex. But this is very similar to building architecture also. Whenever you design a building architecture, you need to satisfy the engineers, you need to satisfy the implementers, but, and you need to eventually satisfy the users who go into the building. right? So the entire stack somehow should be optimized for in this case, I'm using the user as the end user, like me interacting with this. And the entire stack, if it's optimized for the user, you get the best efficiency. But it's not clear if we're designing systems with users in mind today. So it's good to keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, so I guess uh, I should probably ask a question. How should we handle the breaks? I know this is a three-hour lecture, which could be varying, uh, which, which, could be, uh, which could wear you out easily. What do you prefer? One break in the middle, two breaks, no breaks. <laughs> Probably that's not a good idea. Is it time for a break right now, you think, or should we keep going? Say it again? Two breaks. Two breaks, OK. I like the two breaks idea. Two short breaks are better than one long break, probably. So how about we take a break for five minutes? before we get called, and then we'll come back. Five minutes. <laughs> OK, let's get started. I know it's a short break, uh, but we'll, we'll figure out how to handle the breaks more. Uh, and sometimes I can go on and on without a break, so <laughs> if you need a break, you may want to shout. <laughs> And also, based on the previous conversation, if you send me an email and don't get a response, resend. I, I get a lot of emails, and reliability is rel rel relatively low uh, on my end. <laughs> so please, don't be shy to resend the email. <laughs> that's, that's, that's usually a good protocol. <laughs> I won't be offended if you send me 10 emails. <laughs> okay. So what are we talking about? Basically, we are talking about the levels of transformation. What does this enable? This really enables abstraction, right? Levels of transformation uh, are there to create abstractions. An abstraction, what does that mean? Basically, a higher level only needs to know about the interface to the lower level and not how the lower level is implemented. For example, the programmer doesn't need to know about how the computer executes the programs, right? It just needs to know about the interface, the instructions it needs to. Uh, he or she needs to program it. This is nice because you can, uh, you, you can do things without going crazy. You don't need to know everything in the system. Right? So I don't need to know about, for example, exactly how this device operates to be able to use it in a computing architecture. Now that's good because that enables me to be more, much more efficient. I already said that, basically. Uh, An abstraction is good because it, it enables you to be efficient, more productive, no need to worry about decisions made in underlying levels because somebody else who is hopefully expert in those levels makes those decisions. Again, another example is programming in Java versus C versus assembly versus in binary versus by specifying control signals of each transistor every cycle. <laughs> Which one's easier? Hopefully Java is slightly easier, right? If, you do, if, if the programmer needs to deal with the control signals to be able to execute a program, then, yeah, they won't be as productive. But then why would you want to know what goes on underneath or above? 
Well, as a computer architect, you're designing the entire system, so it's a good idea to know that. But even as a software programmer, if that's what you would like to do for the rest of your life, if nothing goes bad, maybe it's OK if you don't know anything at the lower layers, right? Or at the higher layers. But when something goes bad, maybe you don't have a clue as to what's going on, right? For example, if the program you wrote is running slow, how do you figure out why it's running slow? If you don't know anything about the system, you have a problem now. Is it because your SSD is trashing? Is it because you don't have good cache locality? You know, is it because there's some other program that's running in the system? If you don't know how the underlying levels are implemented, then it's going to be not so easy to figure this out. What if the program you wrote does not run correctly? What if the program you wrote consumes too much energy? This is even harder, right? And that's a critical thing over here when you program these things. What if your system just shut down and you have no idea why? <laughs> that happens to me a lot, for example. What if someone just compromised your system and you have no idea how, right? And how to prevent it? Right? All of these tough questions require understanding across the stack. If you know just one level, maybe some of the problems that you see you can solve, but you cannot solve them in the best way or in the most efficient way. And at the Flip side of it, what if the hardware you designed is too hard to program? If you don't know what's going on at the higher levels, you may actually easily design something that's too hard to program. What if the hard hardware you designed is too slow because it doesn't provide the right primitives to the software? Right? The programmer wants to execute deep neural networks, and you're putting things over there that has nothing to do to accelerate them. Right? That's one, like, one other example. And maybe you'll become irrelevant after that as a hardware designer because you don't have that uh, mechanism. OK, and what if you want to design a much more efficient and higher performance system? That's why you need to really cross the abstraction layers. Uh, so two key goals of this course are to understand how a processor works underneath the software layer. And when I say a processor, it's really a processing system. It's not just the processor. It's the memory. It's the storage hierarchy. It's the interconnect. Uh, and how decisions made in hardware affect the software and the programmer and to enable you to be comfortable in making design and optimization decisions that cross the boundaries of these different layers and system components. So that cross the boundary and cross the system component thinking is going to be very important. OK, I'll give you a bunch of examples. So since no one has here taken my digital circuits, this won't be familiar to many of you, hopefully. But uh, today we have these multi-core systems. Everybody knows about multi-core. You have multiple cores, and you have Maybe some private caches, maybe some shared caches, controllers, memory interfaces, and memory. And this is actually an old one. This is a four-core machine. Has anybody used AMD Barcelona? This is circa 2006 or so. It's more than 11 years old, actually. And if you think about the design of it, it's really more than 15 years old, because it was really designed four years before it was shipped. OK, so one, uh, and people have been designing these multi-core systems for a while, because the architects have uh, architecture of single large core become, became more complex. So people have started putting simpler and lower power cores and uh, interconnecting them in some ways. So this is Intel, for example, Core i7. Uh, many of you may not know the system, IBM Cell. This is one of the earliest heterogeneous processors. It had one big processor and a bunch of smaller processors. IBM Power 7, Sun Niagara. We'll cover some of these during this course. And this is an old slide, as you can see, right? I think none of these processors are uh, younger than 2010 or so. <laughs> Everything is old. But people are still designing these systems. The advantage of this is you get parallel processing in a single chip. You, you hopefully, you get faster and new applications. But let's see some problems related to it. Ideally, what you want when you put more cores on a chip is if you, want to, if you put n cores, you want n times the system performance, right? That's perfect scaling, if you will. Now, the problem is, what do we get today? I'll give you one example. This is uh, one measurement we've done uh, when multi-core systems were becoming popular at the time uh, in 2006. The paper was published in 2007. But basically, we've observed that if you run two programs concurrently on two different cores, single-thread programs, one could be MATLAB, for example, the other could be GCC. Uh, and if you measure the performance each of them gets, and compare the performance each of them gets to the performance they would have gotten if they were running alone on the same system. 
for example, MATLAB performance when running together with GCC compared to when it's running alone on the single core without anything running on the other core is only 7% lower. Basically, MATLAB slows down by 7% if it's running together with GCC compared to when it's running alone. Whereas if you look at GCC, this poor guy slows down by 3x, three times, when you run GCC and MATLAB together. So you lose significant performance uh, because you're running with MATLAB. So we call this the memory performance attacks. And if you go and change the priority of these workloads in the operating system, make this low priority and make this high priority, nothing changes. You get the same performance, same slowdown. And this happens because you don't have anything else running in the system. The operating system basically schedules these workloads and doesn't touch them, regardless of their priority. So we call this the memory performance hog because it's really not slowing down at all, almost, but whereas it's causing a lot of trouble to this one. Right? So I guess I'll ask you some questions. Maybe I'll ask you why this is happening. But can you figure out why the applications slow down if you do not know the underlying system and how it works? Hopefully not. Can you figure out why there's a disparity in the slowdowns if you do not know how the system executes the programs? Probably not. Can you fix the problem without knowing what's happening underneath? Probably not. Or maybe you have a fix that's not very efficient. Right. Can anybody guess why this is happening? Why is one application slowing down a lot compared to the other application when they're running together? Cache? Coherence or contention? <laughs> yeah, they're, co they're competing for the cache. That's, that's, that could be one uh, reasonable explanation, actually. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe not. <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's a guess. M MATLAB slows down, but a little bit, just a little bit, right? So that's a, that's a good guess, actually. Cache contention could be a reason for this. And uh, to to answer your concern, you, different applications can get differently affected. For example, MATLAB may not have very good locality use of the cache anyway. So it may actually bring in a lot of stuff into the cache, which hurts GCC because it has very good locality in the cache, but it doesn't hurt MATLAB. Right? That's not what's going on in this case, <laughs> because these cores don't share caches in this case. This is a really old system. <laughs> but that's a very good guess. <laughs> OK, but I, I think you're already thinking underneath, right? You're already thinking what's going on underneath. So OK, there are three questions uh, rephrased. Why is there any slowdown? Why is there a disparity in the slowdowns, which I think you, you, you alluded to? How can we solve the problem if we do not want that disparity? So I guess, what, why is this important, first of all? I think even the slowdown uh, is important because we want to execute applications in parallel in multi-core systems, consolidate more and more, put more things together. This is what cloud computing is all about, for example. If you take applications that are, let's say, from different users, you want to put them together on the same system, and you want to guarantee some performance level to those applications. Mobile phones are examples also, because you, are very, you have very limited resources, but we're already running many, many things on these mobile phones, right? Maybe it's already tracking what I'm saying in this course, right? And maybe it's going to recommend me whatever, the, uh, whatever I'm talking about. The next MATLAB will be on, the <laughs> on my screen <laughs> five minutes later, right? So we want to mix different types of applications together, those requiring quality of service guarantees, it could be many different things, video, pedestrian detection. If you have a self-driving car, you probably want that application to get its quality of service, right? Uh, and those that are important, but less so, and those that are less important or not important at all. So we want the system to be controllable and high performance. So if we get what I just showed you over here, essentially you don't have a high performance system and you don't have control over the system. So let me give you why this is happening in this system. Any other guesses? If you look at this system, if I tell you this is, uh, oh, I, I've already given you the hint, sorry. <laughs> if MATLAB is executing over here and GCC is executing here, 
any other places where these things can interact with each other? It's certainly not the caches in this case, because they're not shared between the cores, but they could interact with interconnect, right, in the share, uh, in the memory controller. And the problem here, in this case, is happening because of the shared DRAM memory system. And when MATLAB and GCC are executing, it turns out they look like this. MATLAB is very intensive. It has a lot of requests. GCC, once in a while, generates requests that have good locality, but locality doesn't matter here. And MATLAB keeps sending requests over and over and over and over, and the memory controller prioritizes them for some reason. And GCC keeps waiting. And the reason is memory controller algorithm is not aware of the different applications. As a result, it's unfair. So it's not fairly treating the different applications. It was not designed to be that way. Well, let's take a look at why it was not designed to be that way. So you need to dig a little bit deeper to understand why people designed it in some way. And I'll, I'll give you the uh, algorithm later on. But if you look at DRAM, if you understand how a DRAM bank operates, we'll talk more about DRAM later in this course, it consists of columns and rows. And this, is, this view of a bank is an abstraction, actually. Internally, there is a lot more going on here. Well, internally, yeah, a bank consists of many cells and other structures that enable access to cells. And it's not a monolithic structure that looks like this. It actually consists of smaller uh, two-dimensional two arrays. But we'll talk about that later. But there is something called a row buffer where data needs to be brought into to be able to read a row. So whenever you read, you actually read an entire row, let's say eight kilobytes of data. Initially, this row buffer is empty. And let's say you want to access uh, an address at row zero, column zero. The processor requests that. It sends this access to the memory controller. The memory controller sends the row address to DRAM. And the DRAM reads that row, which brings the data into the row buffer. All of this is abstraction, of course. Underlying circuits ensure that they work. And we'll talk about how they work later on. So you basically need to send the row address which bring, uh, and uh, tell the DRAM to access the row, activate the row, which brings the data into the row buffer. And the memory controller needs to send the column address, and the DRAM sends the appropriate column from that row through this MUX. OK. Now we've opened this row over here. Let's take a look at the next access. The next access goes to the same row to a different column. Now, we don't need to open this row because this row is already buffered in this buffer over here. So the memory controller sees that, oh, it's a hit in the row buffer because the memory controller knows which row buffers, which banks have which rows open in their row buffers. So it says it's a hit. So it just needs to send the column address. So it's a much faster access now. You can think of this as a small cache right, as part of the DRAM bank. The column address is muxed out. Basically, the column is sent out by the DRAM. And this is a much faster access, because it's a row buffer hit. The next access, it's to column 85, row 0. It, again, it's a row buffer hit. And the memory controller sends the column address, and the data gets out quickly. Now let's take a look at another access, which goes to row 1. Ignore the column. It doesn't matter, actually, which column over here. But it's going to row 1, and the row buffer has row 0 in it. Well, tough luck. We need to open the row 1. What does the memory controller need to do? This is called a row buffer conflict. The data in the row buffer first needs to be written back into the array. Even that's an abstraction. If you know exactly how the circuits work, it's really not a write back, but it's something else. But that's OK. Think of it as a write back. And then the memory controller needs to send the new row address, which takes time. The row gets opened. And then at the end, the memory controller can send the column address and get the data out. So you have two additional operations, write back the existing row in the row buffer, and then open the new row when you get a row conflict, which means that row conflict is much more expensive than the row hit request. And smart memory controller designers optimized for it. Right? Basically, they figured out that row conflict is much more expensive, so they designed the memory scheduling algorithm such that they serviced row hit memory accesses first. So you have a buffer that receives the memory requests coming from different cores. Because memory is slow, that buffer inevitably queues the requests, because it takes time to respond. And they look at uh, the, the control logic looks in this buffer, which requests are row hits. And if there's a row hit, it gets prioritized. Because that's, that can be serviced much faster, right? Lower latency, and you can also improve the bandwidth utilization. And if everything else being equal, it prioritizes older requests over others, because that's it's good for forward progress, right? 
somebody decided, which is true, actually. All this first is a really good mechanism for forward progress, right? So the goal of this policy is to maximize DRAM throughput, row hit first. You get much more data per cycle that way. Assuming all of your requests are row hits, that's good. If, if all of your requests are row conflicts, then your data rate out of memory reduces, because you're not getting the data as fast. It's not a bad policy, right? If you think about a single application accessing memory, maybe that's not a bad policy. You can always critically question that also, and people have actually done that, but I'm not going to go over that. Uh, but if you have two applications that share the DRAM controller, this may be a bad policy because you have two causes of unfairness here, right? Row hit first. If an application has high row buffer locality, it keeps hitting in the row, it gets unfairly prioritized, right? Whereas another application, poor application, that doesn't have very good locality, gets deprioritized because its requests are always deprioritized. I'll show you an example of it. And this oldest first is also an unfair policy because if an application is very memory intensive, it has lo lots of requests, it sends lots of requests to memory at the same time in parallel. Whereas another application sends requests once in a while, it turns out these requests will appear older, right? Just by nature of it. Because this will be delayed behind this other application's many, many requests. That's the problem with oldest first policies in general. They're usually unfair when you have multiple different things because the applications are not sending requests at the same rate. As a result of this, DRAM control is vulnerable to denial of service attacks, and basically, this MATLAB is causing denial of service to GCC. Maybe not intentionally, inadvertently, but that's essentially what's happening. You can actually write programs to exploit this unfairness, or this may happen naturally, just like we've seen with MATLAB and GCC. So let me give you an example of program. When we wrote this paper, we basically said you could actually do these denial of service attacks, and here's an example of a program uh, that is very memory intensive because we constructed to do so. This is a streaming benchmark. Uh, basically, the idea over here is you copy one array to another array in a sequential manner. And assuming your data is mapped in a sequential manner into the row buffer, you keep traversing through the row buffer and always hitting in the row buffer, almost always, because there are other rows, accesses that you have. So basically, this is very sequential memory access, very high row buffer locality, very memory intensive, because as you see over here, we ensure that all of the requests are actually cache misses. Now let's take a look at the control program. Uh, yeah, I've said that. The control program, we called it random. It's random memory access because it's not sequential anymore. You're not traversing the array uh, one line after another. Instead, you're generating a random number and then figuring out where to index into the array. So this is random access. Very, as a result, it has very low row buffer locality. 3% of the access is hit in the row buffer, but it's similarly memory intensive because it's a control workload. Now, if you run these two things together, what would you expect the memory controller would do? Let's take a look. So this is a memory request buffer. This is the picture that I've shown you earlier. Let's assume that row zero is open, and the blue application is the streaming application, the red application is the random access application. Now, the blue application opens row zero, accesses it, the random application keeps generating requests, but they don't get serviced because the memory controller is employing the policy row hit first. Row zero is open. If there's a request to row zero, prioritize it. Which means that as long as the streaming application keeps generating requests to row zero, the random application is out of luck, right? Sounds bad, right? It looks actually ridiculous as I keep doing this. That's why I stopped it here. Yes? <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a good point, but we ensured that it's actually uh, all of the access are cache misses. So you may actually, if you're actually going through word by word, that's true. But if you're actually going, uh, if you have a stride of like 64 words, yeah. And MATLAB is actually like that. But that's a very good point. Yes. Uh, okay. So basically, if this is the case with a row size of eight kilobytes and a request size of, let's say, 64 bytes, which is the cache block, a significant number of requests from stream are serviced before a single request from random can be serviced. 128. That's actually a lot. It could be more. You could construct it actually to be worse, but this is an example case. And that's essentially what's happening between MATLAB and GCC also. Now, that's one of the things that's happening. MATLAB and GCC also, GCC also suffers from oldest first policy because GCC is not as intensive as MATLAB. So it's a combination of effects. 
But this was actually a pretty valid design for a single core processor. Right? For a single core processor where you're not actually executing other applications, memory controller is almost dedicated to a single application, this is not a bad policy. But if you use the same policy when you actually go into multi-core, which is essentially what all manufacturers did, now you're vulnerable to this sort of denial of service. Your system is not as good anymore. And now, actually, people are designing memory controllers uh, that are much, much better, that are much more fair. OK, so how would you solve the problem? Now that we know what happens underneath, how would you solve the problem? There are many, many options here. What is the right place to solve the problem? As an architect, you always have this option. Yes? Yes? Yes. So uh, oldest first was not solving the problem. Oldest first was a scheduling policy that's employed. At some point it becomes older, but it takes a long time for it to become older. So imagine MATLAB generating 100 requests and GC generating one request. At some uh, and MATLAB consist continuously generating 100 requests. GCC at the steady state will, uh, this request will be delayed behind 100 requests. Right. That's why oldest first is not fair. Yeah. Yes. So if, you, if you're interested, you should read the paper. And th this was actually the, the MATLAB performance that 7% uh, degradation versus 3x degradation was measured in a real system. But of course, the proposals later we simulate. And we'll talk about simulation in this course a lot also. OK. Let me animate this again. <laughs> OK. So how, what is the right place to solve the program problem? Can programmers solve this problem? Immediately you say no, because programmer has no idea what other applications running on the system, right? Uh, system software, maybe. But then how does the system software ensure that this doesn't happen? Compiler. Again, compiler has no idea what other applications are running in the system, right? So that's not a good place. Memory controller, I like the solution. <laughs> because a memory controller can, if it knows which applications are generating the request, it can intelligently prioritize the request, right? It can say, it can be more fair in the, in the distribution of memory access to different applications. And that's essentially what we've done. And one of your readings will be about that. DRAM? I don't know. People have proposed having more row buffers, for example, but that doesn't solve the problem fully, and it's also expensive. Circuits? I don't know. If you have a good idea, let me know. <laughs> OK, so there are potential solutions over here. And people have examined a lot the memory controller solution, especially the work we've done in my group. Other people have examined system software solution at the high level. Uh, maybe the solution is really a combination of both. Uh, and we can t we'll talk about some of these issues related to memory later in the course. But this is just to give you an example. Basically, there are two other goals of this course in addition to what we've discussed. One is to enable you to think critically. Like, this is, I think, an example of critical thinking. Where do you solve the problem? What are the different trade-offs associated with it? Or where should you not solve the problem? I guess that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, and enable you to think broadly, because maybe, some, maybe you can come up with a solution that's completely different, right? Okay. So this is one potential reading for your homework one assignment, which is not ready yet, which will be posted sometime later this week. But we'll have homeworks in this course. We'll have programming assignments, and we'll have exams. Uh, a lot of the homeworks uh, will be readings and evaluating the readings. So they'll expose you to new problems, new architectures. So hopefully they'll be fun. Uh, and also critically evaluate uh, the mechanisms. This is work we've done uh, when, when I was at Microsoft. That's why you see Microsoft Research over here. Uh, but I like this paper. It's fun. <laughs> and I would encourage you to critically think about the issues also in systems. Whenever you get a slowdown in a system, like, why is it happening? OK, these are some of the other further readings if you're actually interested in this topic. So we've actually looked at some system software solutions also. I'll give you the very I idea very quickly over here. Basically, if you have multiple memory channels in the system, if one application interferes with another application badly, why don't you map them to different channels, different memory? buses, basically. That way, they don't interfere with each other. That's the basic idea over here. But then how do you make it work is another question. And we'll talk about how to make things work in this course a lot. OK, so the takeaway is 
breaking the abstraction layers between components and transformation hierarchy levels and knowing what's underneath enables you to understand and solve problems. And in the end, as I said, we're here to solve problems, right? But if in order to solve them, you need to understand them as well. Okay, let me give you a couple of other examples. Is this fun so far? Who's not having fun? I'm open to different opinions, don't, don't be shy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hopefully people are having fun. So there's a lot of literature, of course, uh, beyond this, uh, on this particular topic, actually. And there uh, we're, we, we are still working on it in my research group, but other people are also working on it. And actually, uh, yeah, this paper over here, some of the ideas that uh, we proposed over here are variants of them are implemented in the Samsung SOC, Samsung memory controllers, and maybe others also, but they don't tell me. <laughs> so it's, uh, if you actually figure out the problems, you can actually impact the way the systems are designed today. Okay, I'll give you another example. And this is another example. I'll, I'll give you examples from memory in this lecture, because memory is one of the bigger bottlenecks today, but we'll talk a lot about uh, other things in this lecture also. For example, GPUs, uh, parallel systems, multiprocessors. Okay, DRAM is here in the system. And if you look at DRAM, let's break the abstraction layer a little bit more. Remember I showed you that two-dimensional array? And I said there are eight kilobytes in a row? Well, this is one bit in that DRAM cell, basically. This is the DRAM cell. It's as a capacitor where the data is stored and as an access transistor. And it has a word line that enables the access transistor. When you enable the access transistor, the charge in this capacitor gets shared with the bit line. And that's how you figure out whether a zero is stored or a one is stored, whether the capacitor is charged or discharged. Is this too low level for people here? Yeah? No? Who thinks this is too low level? This is what, what I'd like to gauge the, uh, because we have a, a variety of students taking this course, I'd like to gauge that. Low level? Not low level, it's good? Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right. Well, you'll learn about it. It's not that, nothing, nothing is rocket science here. <laughs> Everything is based on principles. And the, the way this operates is based on the charge sharing principle, right? The capacitor is charged. If it's charged, it shares and loses some of its charge to the bit line. As a result, you figure out that it has a one or zero, however you encode it. If, it, uh, if it doesn't have charge, it perturbs the bit line and drives the bit line to zero, right? That's essentially what's happening over here. But again, okay, this DRAM cell consists of this capacitor and access transistor, and a DRAM chip consists of tens of thousands of rows of such of cells, right? This is a row, basically. A row is... Uh, enabled by this word line, it's also called row enable, and you read many, many of these at the same time. Okay, and we're gonna go in more into the detail of this architecture because this is changing a lot today, and it's an important part of the system, but we'll talk about that later in the course. Uh, so one issue with this technology, and this is a technology problem because we're using this capacitor to store the charge. The charge naturally leaks over time. It's not a perfect circuit, it's not non-volatile, charge leaks which means that the memory controller needs to refresh each row periodically to restore the charge, which means that you need to activate each row every n milliseconds. Activate is what I showed you earlier, basically activate the row, which brings the data into the row buffer. Right. That replenishes the charge, because what happens is when you activate the row, you sense the charge, you amplify it in the sense amplifiers, and naturally write it back into the cells. That's how you refresh, us, refresh the row. And today, the typical N is 64 milliseconds. Every 64 milliseconds, every single row in the system gets refreshed. So this thing is essentially doing that right now. Nothing else, maybe, but that. <laughs> because it's keeping the memory intact. So there are many downsides to this, of course, right? Every 64 milliseconds, you consume a lot of energy. You lose performance if you're actually running something else in the system. You need to refresh it when you're running it. DM rank. Don't worry if you don't know what a rank is, but basically bank is unavailable when it's refreshed. It has an impact on quality of service. Maybe you get long pause times during refresh if you don't do it intelligently. So you need to schedule the refreshes intelligently also. And it turns out this refresh rate limits DRAM capacity scaling, and I'll give you an example of this. So this is not good, basically. But first, let's do some analysis, which you will do in your homework also. Uh, since we're a small class, actually, uh, I'd like more discussion also. So if you, if you want to discuss the homework sometime, we'll discuss it later on. But let's imagine a system with eight exabyte DRAM. 
two to the 63 bytes. That's a lot, right? You may think it's a lot, but modern supercomputers already have almost an exabyte DRAM. I, I've kept track, uh, I've, I've lost track of it, but I think the Chinese Tianhe 2 has certainly close to ex exabyte. Does anybody know? Or you can figure it out easily on Wikipedia. <laughs> but this is a lot of memory. <laughs> Uh, and imagine a row size, well, assume a row size that says 8 kilobytes. That's 2 to 13 bytes. I made life easy. How many rows are there? 2 to the 50. That's a no-brainer, right? How many refreshes happen in 64 milliseconds? 2 to the 50, right? You need to refresh 2 to the 50 rows every 64 milliseconds, because that's the specification. What is the total power consumption of DRAM refresh in such a system like this? No, I don't know the answer because I'm missing some values here, but that's your job in your first assignment, to do some research to figure out how much power each UFF consumes and multiply that with 2 to the 50, essentially. And what is the total energy consumption of DRAM refresh during a day? Now, once you have the power consumption, you just multiply power with time to get the energy consumption, right? That's, that's easy. So it's a good exercise. <laughs> it's humbling, I think. <laughs> Oh, wait, it's, an, it's part of the assignment. It's not a brownie points. <laughs> That's part of the homework. <laughs> it was brownie, brownie points for the digital circuits class. <laughs> so it'll be fun. But some people in the digital circuits class did it also, actually, and they got brownie points. But this will hopefully give you an exa uh, example of the wastage that we have in the system today. So, for example, this battery is affected by that wastage right now. There's nothing else that really consumes the battery right now but keeping memory intact because the technology is not good enough, right? If you think about it, this is really a technological problem. If your memory was non-volatile, if it didn't lose the charge, then you wouldn't have this problem. That's one of the advantages of upcoming me emerging memory technologies uh, that are non-volatile. And that's one of the promises, right? If you've heard about memristors, for example, or phase change memory, or magnetic random access memory, they're non-volatile to begin with. They don't have this problem. As a result, you can save a lot of energy if you can employ them in the system. But the problem is they have other problems, which we will talk about when we talk about that emerging technology part. Okay, so this will be a, an example. So let's take a look at some analysis. I don't expect you to understand all of this analysis, but this is one of the readings that I'm assigning as part of homework one, uh, which will be up sometime. But let's, uh, this paper does the analysis. It looks at the capacity of devices. This is a DRAM chip. And today we have eight gigabit chips. In the future, we'll have 64 gigabit chips, hopefully. And that's the goal, because memory capacity enables a lot of things in the system. By having a lot of memory capacity, we we've enabled a lot of applications. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of time you need to spend to refresh that memory, we meaning the percentage of time the memory is unavailable. Today, it's about, let's say, 8 to 10 percent. But if the scaling keeps as is, if you build a 64 gigabit device, it's going to be 46%. This is looking forward now, right? What's going to happen in the future? If you don't do something about it, memory refresh is going to consume 46% of the time. And this is based on some scaling assumptions. Uh, one of the things is by going from 8 gigabits to 64 gigabit, you're increasing the number of rows. So you need more rows to refresh. And the other is your technology needs to be smaller, meaning that refresh becomes a bigger problem. You need to frequent more, uh, refresh more frequently. And we'll go into more detail. That's why this is increasing. Uh, exponentially like this. But of course, there are other projections, and I'll talk about that later on also. And, but, but it's bad, basically. If you, we don't want a device uh, for which 50% of the time we're not doing anything, because it needs to refresh itself, right? Sounds bad. It's like, uh, always I think about human memory also. Sometimes you need to refresh your memory, and you cannot use it, right? Human memory is not perfect either. OK, energy overhead is another issue. Basically, this is, again, this device capacity over here and percentage of DRAM energy spent for refreshing. This is assuming some ac access uh, pattern. For example, right now, this is spending almost 100% of the DRAM energy for refreshing, right? Because we're not doing any other access. But assuming you have some reasonable access pattern, today you spend about 15%. But if you have a DRAM chip that has 64 gigabit capacity, we'll spend 50% almost. Uh, of the energy on refreshing. Nothing useful, just refreshing to keep the data alive. So we don't want this future. That's what we said, actually, when we wrote this paper over here. So how do we solve the problem again, right? 
there may be many, many solutions. Any ideas at the moment? You may not be exposed to the problem, so you may not have ideas. But again, you need to dig deeper. <laughs> you can say, I don't care about the data, so I shouldn't refresh it. Right? That could be one solution. <laughs> if you can tolerate the faults, yeah, that could be not an unreasonable solution. But that's not a very general solution, probably, right? Because most of us care about the data that's stored. So if you dig deeper, you will observe that, well, this is not the, today we all, all DRAM rows are refreshed every 64 milliseconds. So a critical thinking can say, do we really need to do this? Do we really need to refresh all rows every 64 milliseconds? Right. What if we knew what happened underneath and exposed that information to the upper layers? So basically underneath, if you dig deeper, you'll find that most rows don't need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. In fact, a very small fraction of the rows need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. And most, an overwhelming majority of the, of the rows can retain data for 256 milliseconds or longer. So if you figure out these different rows, you can easily say, oh, I'm going to refresh these rows at 256 milliseconds, every 256 milliseconds, and these rows every 64 milliseconds, and these rows every 128 milliseconds, if you know the data retention time of the rows. That sounds nice, right? That's the beauty of knowing what's going on underneath, right? If you had no idea what went underneath, you wouldn't be able to exploit this. Now you can ask why this is happening, right? Why do we have such a profile? Any guesses? Good thing you didn't take the digital circus class. <laughs> well, the answer is manufacturing is not perfect. <laughs> you cannot manufacture everything to have 64 millisecond retention time. Not all DRAM cells are exactly the same. Some of, them, some of them have huge capacitors. Some of them have weak capacitors. Some of them have weak access transistors, large access transistors, all kinds of combinations. Right? Because manufacturing is not perfect. Some are more leaky than others as a result of this. Some of, can, can, some of them can store a lot of charge. Some of them can store very little charge. And those very little charge cells are the problematic ones. They cannot retain charge for a long time because the charge leaks very quickly. And this is called manufacturing process variation. And as a result of this, we have this profile. But this profile opens up an opportunity also. Today, uh, the specification is that you need to refresh everything every 64 milliseconds because that ensures that all of the data is intact, right? But if we can somehow figure out the retention time of each row exactly, we can do something with that information, right? So what can we do with that information? I, said, I already gave you an example, right? Who do we expose this information to? Memory controller sounds reasonable, right? If the memory controller knew, knows how often to refresh each row, it can take advantage of this to reduce the refresh rate by almost 4x, because the retention time profile that I showed you, almost all of the rows, well, an overwhelming majority of the rows can be refreshed at 4x lower the rate, 256 milliseconds. But you can expose it to the, I don't know, the operating system also, right? The operating system can say, oh, this part of the DRAM, I, I, uh, it needs to be refreshed very often, so I'm not going to allocate it to anybody. So I don't need to, uh, so all of DRAM will be refreshed every two, say 256 milliseconds, and the cells that are not going to retain that data, they're not going to be allocated to anyone. That's another possibility, right? How much information do we expose? This could be actually a lot of information. In fact, today, in the memory side, there is no information exposed to the memory controller or the operating system. That's one thing we're trying to change right now. And that's why the space is very open right now. <laughs> I like your thinking. Yes, that's one of the, <laughs> that's one of the ways of figuring out uh, how, uh, how often, uh, how, how long a, a row can retain data, right? So you basically are proposing a mechanism to figure out the retention time. More, more, uh, yeah, basically, you figure out the retention time. Let's say, let's say you boot up the system, you figure out the retention time, and you record it somewhere, right? I like that idea. Keep that thought. <laughs> we'll cover that. <laughs> so how much information you expose actually affects the overheads, power consumption, verification complexity, and cost. So imagine you have two terabytes of DRAM and eight kilobytes of rows. How many rows is that? That's a lot, right? So if you have this retention time information for every single row, that's a lot of memory also. So you need to store that somewhere. And you need to store that at a place that needs to be refreshed a lot, right? Or in non-volatile memory, in disk somewhere. So you have this complexity now. 
And how do we determine this profile information? That's what you mentioned, basically. How do you figure out how long each row store data? So let's talk, and also who determines it? Is it the DRAM manufacturer? Is it the system designer? Is it me right now? Or is it every time I turn off the system, does it need to determine, or does it need to do it only once? All of these are actually really interesting questions, right? An architect who has this idea needs to deal with these questions. And they all actually span across the stack. Okay, so let me give you some data, real data. This is actually a data from, uh, this paper has this graph, but it's borrowed from uh, a paper from Samsung. Uh, and basically, what th that paper from Samsung showed that an overwhelming majority of DRAM rows can be refreshed much less often without losing data. For example, if you have a 32 gigabyte DRAM, only 1,000 cells need to be refreshed more frequently than 256 milliseconds, and only 30 cells need to be refreshed more frequently than every 128 milliseconds. Now you can ask why this is the case. Why, why didn't the manufacturer cut this off, right? Well, because if you cut that off, you'll lose a lot of chips. You won't be able to put them into uh, the field, and you will, you will lose a lot of yield, what is called yield, and in the end, money. That's why these cells exist, because if you cut them off, yeah, exactly. You'll lose money. <laughs> so can we exploit this to reduce refresh operations at low cost? Uh, yeah, I've given you this. And the key idea of uh, this paper that you're going to read is refresh weak rows more frequently and all other rows less frequently. Let me give you the idea a little bit more. Basically, there's a mechanism. You need to do profiling. You need to identify the retention time of all DRM rows. This can be done at design time or during operation, like you mentioned. You need to store the rows somehow efficiently. You need to bin the rows. So you can have a retention time associated with each row, and you can encode that. Let's say you have three different retention times, 64 milliseconds, 128 milliseconds, and 256 milliseconds. That requires two bits per row, right, to encode. If you have two to the 30 rows, two bits per row is a lot of encoding. You need to store that information somewhere. So this paper that you're going to read uses Bloom filters for efficient and scalable storage. Anybody know what Bloom filters are? Two? That's it? Well, that's good. I'm going to teach you something. <laughs> it's not a computer architecture concept necessarily, but it's a concept that I think everybody needs to know. <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So basically DRAM, you have this profile. And by using Bloom filters, you can actually have only 1.25 kilobyte storage for a 32 gigabyte DRAM memory, as opposed to two bits per row. OK. And once you have this information stored in the memory controller, Memory control refreshes rows and different bins at different rates. It basically checks whenever it needs to refresh an address, it says, oh, do I need to refresh it right now? It checks the frequency of refresh. OK, so let me give you some results to motivate this sort of mechanism. So how do you actually motivate, look at this mechanism? As a computer architect, you need to understand how to evaluate things. As I mentioned earlier, there are evaluation criteria, and there are also methods for evaluation. So in this case, we've actually done a lot of simulation to figure out, and you will get used to that simulation in the programming assignments. Uh, and this is C high-level simulation. You have the uh, design of a memory controller and the system, and we evaluate various workloads. Well, hardware cost is not simulation, sorry. But we figure out that the refresh reduction is 74.6%. And this leads to a dynamic DRAM energy reduction of 16%, because you're not issuing refreshes dynamically when you're running. And when the DRAM is idle, when you're not doing anything in the system, that also leads to a power reduction, 20%. And the performance improvement on the evaluated workload is about 9%. That sounds like a no-brainer, right? You're improving everything with some little hardware cost. And actually, the more important thing, as an architect, you always look into the future. Not today, but future. Benefits actually increase as DRAM scales in density. Remember this graph, device capacity, in this case, energy per access over here? If you have a 4 gigabit device, the savings is about 16%. But if you have a 64 gigabit device, refresh is a much bigger problem, so your savings is actually 50%. So in the future, this idea will be much more important. So it's always good to, as an architect, think about the future, not today. Because you're really designing for the future. And if you look at it, this, there's another point here that I would like to make. Uh, these are device, this is the scaling that we see, this is exponential. Have we solved the refresh problem? Uh, ideally, you would like energy per access to remain constant, right, across generations. Oh, I see. So uh, this is uh, the capacity of a single DRAM chip. You, you use many, many DRAM chips to get to 32 gigabytes, OK? 
And what really affects your refresh rate is the capacity of a single DRAM chip. Because if you, that, re, that requires more rows, more cells per area, and that affects the refresh rate. So if you look over here, this is, again, another thing that you could do with a simulator. This is device capacity on the x-axis, and this is performance. We're not going to talk about metrics later on, but assume that this is performance. This is a multi-program met performance metric called weighted speed up. With a 4 gigabit chip-based design, you get 9% performance improvement. But if your DRAM chips are much larger, you get 108% performance improvement. So performance impact of this idea also increases as you have a higher capacity device. So ideally, you would like to have ideas like this, right, that become much better into the future. Okay. So this is going to be one of the potential readings. <laughs> and I like this paper because it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm not saying it's because of my own child, but, <laughs> but it's always good to think about the downsides also. I'd like you to think critically and question things in the paper. That's one of the things that we will do in the reading assignments in this course. Question, can you do better? What's not working here? I'm going to give you what's not working in a little bit. OK, let me delve a little bit deeper. Oh, OK, if you're interested, there are some further readings also. And these readings will be posted on the website. I mean, there's a bunch of other further readings that I'm not posting over here. Uh, I'll give you a takeaway, and then we'll, t we'll take a little break, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to dig a little bit more deeper, actually. So basically, the sec takeaway, again, is breaking the abstraction layers and knowing what's underneath enables you to understand and solve problems, right? If you didn't know about what's going on in the DRAM cells, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of it. And the second takeaway, cooperation between multiple components and layers can enable more effective solutions and systems. So in this case, you need cooperation, right? Somebody needs to communicate that information about the retention time of the rows to somebody else. Be it the memory, in this case, the memory controller, but you could think about communicating that to the operating system as well. You always have the question of who, and we will delve uh, into that question uh, just in five minutes. <laughs> five minutes is good? OK. OK, I think our five minutes are up, including the 30-second margin that I put. <laughs> margin is always good in design. That's a principal design approach also. <laughs> and one of the reasons why things need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds is the additional margin the uh, manufacturers put also. And we'll see why that, that is also there. So if you eliminate the margins, you all face risk reliability issues. If you put margins, you're more reliable, but then you lose something else, performance, energy, in this case, both, right? OK, let's dig deeper uh, a little bit into this. I'm not going to go uh, over into a whole lot of detail, which we'll perhaps cover later on. But I'll, I'll show you that an idea like this that sounds beautiful may be actually very difficult to implement uh, in real life. We'll see why that is. So this is one quote that you may have heard about. Good ideas are a dime a dozen. Have you heard about that? This is a very American way of saying. And I hope I, I will at some point come to a point in saying this in German, but I have no idea <laughs> at this point. <laughs> uh, basically, this says that there are good ideas everywhere. <laughs> a dime a dozen, basically. If you give a dime, you get a dozen, of good dozen good ideas. But making them work is oftentimes a real contribution. <laughs> so you may have a good idea, but if you don't make it work, it's in the end useless. Now, it's, it's, it has some value, of course. It may inspire somebody else to do something good, right, or somebody else to make it work. So in that sense, it's not completely useless. But it's really making the idea work is the real contribution at, at, in the end. So let's see, let's see how we can make Raider work. Uh, so it, remember, it consists of three steps, profiling, binning, and refreshing. And binning solves a particular problem. Refreshing is the easy part, basically. If you know how frequently you need to refresh a row, you can easily implement something that does refresh it. There's no, nothing really magic over here. Binning solves an important problem, which is it reduces a lot of hardware cost into 1.25 kilobytes, and I will tell you about that. But it turns out the real difficulty is over here, the first part. How do you figure out the retention time of all DRAM rows? And you said that you can actually do this, which is essentially what many, many works have proposed. Basically, let's say at system boot up time, or at some point, you figure out the retention time of a row. And to be able to do that, you write some data to the row. You prevent it from being refreshed, assuming you have that capability in your memory controller. And most memory controllers today actually have that capability. You may or may not be exposed to it as a programmer, but firmware is exposed to it. Uh, and measure the time before data corruption. So basically, you, do, you keep doing this. Initially, you write some values. 
you look at what the uh, result is after 64 milliseconds, and you repeat the experiment after 128 milliseconds. Oh, this guy got some data corruption, so it, may, it probably doesn't retain data uh, for 128 milliseconds, so I should refresh it every 64 milliseconds. Right. That's how you figure out the retention time. This got some data corruption after 256 milliseconds, so it probably doesn't re I need to refresh it every 256 milliseconds. Right. So you keep doing that for all rows. Now, this is a very time-consuming pro process. This is brute force profiling. And this consumes time also. So you don't want to do this, hopefully, every time you boot up either. Maybe you want to do this once, store the data somewhere on the disk, and then when you load it, uh, when you boot up the system, you load it and then uh, do the appropriate thing. Sounds good, right? Now, even this doesn't work. <laughs> so basically, it's not really this easy. <laughs> Why? There are two big challenges to this. And I'm not going to go into the detail a lot over here. One challenge is the data pattern dependence of retention time. I showed you over here once, you write all ones. OK, you get some retention time. But if you write all zeros, you get some other retention time. If you write 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, you get some other retention time. If you write some other pattern, which could be a lot of patterns if you can imagine, right? Actually, if you have an 8 kilobyte row, it's 2 to the 8 kilobytes, <laughs> whatever that value is. And it's not just that row, actually. It's about the other rows also. What data values are stored in the other rows affect this. Why? Because the cells are close to each other. There's coupling, capacitive coupling that happens between these cells. As a result, the value that you store in this capacitor affects the retention time of this capacitor. And I'm not going to go over this in detail, but there are various forms of coupling, bit line to bit line coupling, word line to bit line coupling when you activate the uh, row. Yes, exactly. So you need to figure out what's the worst case, basically, worst case pattern. There has to be one, but it's very difficult to figure out. <laughs> it turns out this is very difficult to figure out. It's, it's dependent on uh, both uh, the design of the architecture, but also the manufacturing process variation. That's the unfortunate part. <laughs> so that's one of the tough things. OK, let's assume that you figure this out somehow. There's another problem, which is actually perhaps harder to solve. It's called the variable retention time phenomenon. And this basically phenomenon says that it's a physical phenomenon that basically uh, it's a phenomenon that you test the retention time today. The cell can retain data for, I don't know, eight minutes. It's possible, actually. Sometimes the cell retains data for eight minutes. But you test the retention time five hours later or even two minutes later, the cell retains data only for 64 milliseconds. And it turns out this is a random process. It looks like this, basically. This is a real design. Uh, it's in terms of hours over here, and the retention time is in terms of seconds because we actually do this testing at low temperatures. Uh, basically, you see that you don't do anything else. Data patterns remain the same. You just measure the retention time of the same cell at different times. It can retain data for a long time over here. This is the maximum retention time we measure. But sometimes it dips, as you can see. So this is the phenomenon of variable retention time. This happens because of a circuit level issue which was discovered in 1987 by Yeni. And the issue is charge gets trapped randomly in the access transistor. And then when that charge gets trapped, the, uh, because of trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage, the charge leaks quickly outside the access transistor through, uh, from the capacitor through the access transistor. So that trap. And people have not figured out how to predict that charge trapping. It's a random process, as far as, I, as, far as we know. And our experiments suggest that it's a random process also. So basically, <laughs> because of these two phenomena, it's very difficult. So there doesn't seem to be a way of determining if a cell exhibits VRT without actually observing a cell exhibiting VRT, variable retention time. It's a memoryless random process. And this complicates retention time profiling by DRAM manufacturers also. So it turns out uh, there's another problem which exacerbates all of these. Let's assume that the DRAM manufacturer did a lot of testing and profiled and figured out the cells that have low retention time. Somehow. Even that's hard. But if, after, after you actually uh, take the DRAM chip, solder it on a board, assuming you're doing soldering, you expose it to high temperatures, and that high temperature exposure actually changes the retention time profile completely. So now the answer to the question, who should do this profiling? Well, it's not the DRAM manufacturer. Because somebody else, when you install that chip somewhere else, 
that changes. And VRT actually changes also. Yes, uh, exactly. So basically, uh, the conclusion is, if you want to make this retention time profiling work, you need error correcting codes. And the idea is, uh, you reduce the refresh rate, you do exactly what we've discussed, uh, maybe find the worst case data pattern somehow, or approximate it somehow, and that's some of the f future work that we've done. Uh, but if you have error correcting codes, now you have a mechanism that says, oh, there's an error, and that's hopefully because I reduced the refresh rate. And then you can figure out, you can back off, right? If you get an error, hopefully it's corrected with your error correcting code, so you won't run into reliability issues, but you can back off and you can say, oh, I'm gonna refresh these rows that give me error correction problems uh, more frequently. So that's the idea, that's, that's how you make it work. But I'm not gonna go into the detail of how you exactly make it work, that's a separate work over here. So you need to, so it, of course this comes at a cost. The cost is error correction code overhead, right? Now you need to have an error correcting code associated with each DRAM row. Well, too bad. <laughs> There's no free lunch. <laughs> now the question is, does that error correcting code consume more power and can lead to more problems than your refresh does? It turns out the answer is yes. The, the answer is no. You can actually use error correcting codes nicely to reduce the refresh rate significantly. Uh, and if we get to it, I'd be happy to point you to papers related to that. And the other nice, interesting thing is in this field right now, uh, DRAM manufacturers are putting error correcting codes internally into the DRAM chips. Because they're at a point right now, they're already having a lot of circuit level issues that they're not able to manufacture DRAM reliably without having error correcting codes. So they, are, they already put in, for example, the next generation chips that you buy for LPDDR low power chips and also DDR, they will contain error correcting codes. So maybe you can use those codes to actually do this profile. So if you want to understand these issues, uh, we have written this paper in 2013. It's basically an experimental study with, the, with an infrastructure to figure out the data retention behavior. And this has discovered those two issues, data pattern dependence, variable retention time. So the first step was, oh, Raider presents an opportunity. The thinking is, how do we make it work? Well, how do we make it work? We need to test some real DRAM chips to figure out what are the real issues. And that the paper actually is actually pessimistic about uh, Raider working. But then we wrote, we, we, we've written other papers, and I will talk about that separately in the future, perhaps, when we talk about the memory in more detail. Okay. But if you want to, if you want to read one, one paper on experimental analysis of DRAM, make it be this one. <laughs> I'm not going to have you review it, maybe not right now at least. So let's look at the binning aspect, because bi the, the, the Raider paper actually solves this binning problem, exploiting bloom filters. And I like including this, because bloom filters will be useful for whatever you do in your career, I think. Uh, the key question is, how do you efficiently and scalably store rows into retention time bits? One option, as I said, is for each row in the system have two bits, specifying how often it needs to be refreshed, assuming you have three different refresh bins. But that's costly. So we use ho hardware bloom filters. These are beautiful data structures. Basically, it's a probabilistic data structure that compactly represents set membership. It gives you the presence or absence of element in a set. It's not perfect, it's probabilistic. It has false positives. Basically, what I described earlier is having two bits per row, it's non-approximate set membership, it's exact set membership. Well, in this case, use one bit per element to indicate absence of presence of each element from an element space of n elements. Well, <laughs> basically two bits per row, right. But approximate set membership, you use a much smaller number of bits and indicate an element's presence or absence with a subset of those bits. Some elements map to the bits, other elements also map to. That's the problem that you get. So let me give you an example. And you can do multiple operations. You can insert stuff, you can test whether the element exists, and you can remove all the elements. So let me give you an example. So basically, you have a bit vector. And this bit vector, it could, it could be as small as this, uh, indicates presence or absence of an address. Let's say this, is, this bit vector specifies the addresses, the row addresses, that should be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. I don't know how many bits we have over here, but let's say 16. <laughs> and let's say we, we figured out row one needs to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. When we figure out that during profiling, we need to insert that row one. So how do we insert this thing into the bloom filter? Basically, we hash the address one using three different hash functions. Uh, basically takes the address bits and XORs some of them, this hash function, and it maps to this bit. The second hash function ma maps to this bit, 
and the third hash function ma maps to this bit. So to insert row one, you set those three bits that the hash function maps to, uh, hash functions map the address to. Now those three bits are set, which means that row one is present in the bit vector. Now this is actually a complicated example. Let's assume you don't have two hash functions, you have only one hash function. That's also enough, right? You insert row one, you go through a hash function, you set a bit, that bit indicates the presence of row one in the bit vector. Now the reason we have multiple hash functions is because if your, if your filter is small, if your bit vector is small, multiple elements can map to the same bit, and then you have aliasing. Right? So if you use three different hash functions that are different functions, uh, what you get is three different bits indicating all the, presence of, the presence of row one is indicated by all of those bits being set to one at the same time, which reduces the probability of multiple different addresses mapping to the same bits. Okay. So let's, so if you want to, this is how you insert a row into a Bloom filter. Now let's say if we want to test the presence of that row. We go through the same hash functions with the same address, and we probe those bits. Because we inserted this row one before, those bits are set to one, and if all of the bits are set to one, the Bloom filter says, oh, row one is present. You've given me this address, and all of the bits that this address maps to are set to one, so row one is present. So that's the idea, basically. You can insert at profiling time, and you can probe at refreshing time. So let's say uh, we, we haven't inserted row two, but we check row two's presence. You go through the same hash functions. It turns out hash function one maps to this bit, zero. Hash function two happens to map to the same bit that was set by row one. Hash function three maps to another bit that's zero. But because you have at least one zero bit over here, the Bloom filter says you have not inserted row two, which is correct. We have not inserted row two. Which means that row two is not going to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds, right? Let's say we insert row four. It sets these three bits. Now let's say we probe if row five is present. Row five is present. We go through the hash functions. And it, ha it so happens that the bits that we get are all one. They're all one, but we didn't insert row five, right? We insert only row four and row one. Well, too bad. This is a false positive. We didn't have enough bits to distinguish between them, and our hash functions were not good enough. As a result, you get this false positive. So row five is declared present in the Bloom filter, even though it wasn't. This is not a bad for reliability, because you're going to refresh it every 64 milliseconds. It's OK. But you do extra refreshes, right? So that's the trade-off that you run into. You, ha you, ha you have much fewer bits than storing two bits per row, but you get these false positives, which means that you have some extra refreshes. So this is the, the one example of a Bloom filter, basically. If you want to learn more about it, you can read this theoretical paper by Bloom uh, in 1970. But basically, uh, yeah, the computational factors considered are the size of the hash area space, which is the size of the Bloom filter, the time required to identify a message as a non-member of a given set, reject time, that's basically the probing of the Bloom filter, and an allowable error frequency. That's basically the false positives, essentially. So you can trade off between these things to represent the set. Uh, and in such applications, so such applications, refresh is one example. In this case, you can tolerate false positives, right? Because a false positive means you're going to refresh a row more frequently than it's needed. But you don't have false negatives. The Bloom filter never returns true for something you didn't insert. No, that's not true. The other way around. <laughs> uh, let me see. So you've inserted something. The balloon filter never tells you, uh, tells you that you didn't insert that thing. That's a false negative. You don't want that to happen, because if you have a false negative, you're wrong. Uh, you, you have reliability issues. But basically, you can uh, read the, I would I encourage you to read this paper. It's a short paper. It's not a computer architecture, because this is really a software construct also, right? This doesn't need to be hardware. That's the beauty of architecture, again. You can do, the, do things in software, do things in hardware. So we're applying the notion of Bloom filters to, uh, uh, to hardware right now. So what are the advantages of this? Internet? I've given you some of these, actually, but let's, uh, let's talk about this. This also gives you the style of this course. So you have this idea. The idea is to use Bloom filters. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of those? So basically, I will talk about the advantages and disadvantages of Bloom filters. 
uh, not applied to this problem uh, in general, basically. So b basically, it enables storage efficient representation of set membership. This is all hopefully clear. Insertion and testing for set membership are fast. You insert very quickly. Those hash functions, of course, need to be quick, right? So there's a trade-off there. If you want more complicated hash functions, that reduces your error frequency, as Bloom put it, but that's slower. Uh, no false negatives. If Bloom filter says an element is not present in the set, the element must not have been inserted. That's good. And it enables trade-offs between time, storage efficiency, and false positive rate via sizing and hashing. The disadvantages are false positives, basically. An element may be deemed to be present uh, in the set by the Bloom filter, but it may never have been inserted. So it's not the right data structure why you cannot tolerate false positives. <laughs> okay, as refresh rate bins, false positives are okay. A row, if it's, not ne if it's never inserted, it may be declared in the Bloom filter, but then you just refresh it more frequently. You lose some opportunity, basically. Now, if this happens a lot, then this is bad, probably, right? So you need to size it such that this doesn't happen extremely often. No false negatives, oh, that's good. No correctness problems. So it's also scalable. So this is one of the other benefits of Bloom filters in hardware. So think about uh, this, again, think about the future. You've designed the system. Today, you have 32 gigabytes of memory. Assume that you allocated two bits per row for 32 gigabytes. In the future, somebody decided to increase your memory size to one terabytes. The two bits per row that you dedicated for 32 gigabytes are now useless because somebody increased your memory size. So you really need a scalable data structure. You either need to over-provision envisioning the future's memory size, meaning you'll lead to much higher cost, or you use something like Bloom filters, <laughs> which is scalable. <laughs> Basically, Bloom filter never overflows. Right, unlike a fixed size table. You just keep setting bits. Well, in a, in a sense, at some point, all of the bits become one, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe not so good. <laughs> but if you actually size it a little bit larger, give it a little bit more margin, you're OK still. At least you're not incorrect. You can still use the mechanism. You're, you're still correct in your mechanism. Right? So it's scalable. And it's efficient. There's no need to store info on a per row base. And the paper has this analysis, basically. You can get away with very small hardware costs for a 32 gigabyte DRAM system. OK, we've already discussed this. So I think uh, hopefully you've understood what Bloom filters are. We'll have an exercise of this in some, one of the homeworks, actually, if my TAs remind me later today. Um, this work is one of the works that use Bloom filters. But later, we'll talk about caches in this course also, and I'll give you another work that talks, uses Bloom filters for more efficient cache replacement and cache management. Again, this is a scalability of the Bloom filter is very useful. Uh, in this case. OK, so the third part of Raider is the easiest part, refreshing. Basically, you choose a refresh candidate row, determine which bin the row is in by probing the Bloom filter, and determine if refreshing is needed. Yes? Yes? So when you insert something, you're asking, right? Oh, exactly. Uh, so that's a good point. Removing is not allowed in the Bloom filter. You don't have an easy way of, you yeah. Exactly. You would have to recompute it completely. That, that's the downside. That's another downside. I should have added that actually in the disadvantages because you cannot remove a single element from a Bloom filter. You can clear the Bloom filter, which requires recomputation of everything. But the good thing is in this application, the refresh rate, you really want the worst case retention time. So if you figured out that this particular row at some point, <laughs> Uh, exhibits 64 is in the is, should be in the 64 millisecond bin. You don't want to remove it from that bin. <laughs> so your application matches really well <laughs> in this case. But that's a very good point. So people have actually developed other bloom filters, like counting bloom filters, that are a little bit better in terms of the removal of elements. But this is a fundamental problem with the bloom filters. There's a lot of literature <laughs> on this. Okay. Uh, so the re this is an easy part, basically. You, lo you look up the Bloom filter and decide whether you want to refresh the row, and the paper has an algorithm for it. This is really easy, so you don't need to worry about it. Of course, it needs to be implementable in hardware again, so there there's some trick over here also, uh, because it's not, again, software, right? You need to make sure things are simple. OK, so there's another design choice in the Raider. The paper describes it this way, basically. In the paper, DRAM doesn't change. 
uh, and refresh control is in uh, the in, in DRAM. Basically, what what today uh, people do is memory controller sends a refresh command, and DRAM refreshes a bunch of rows, and the memory controller has no idea which rows are refreshed. The job of the memory controller is just to send a refresh command periodically. It sounds stupid, right? But that's how things are designed today. Uh, there's a good reason for it. That way, you don't need to send the address, right, which consumes power. And this bus is one of the biggest power consumers over here. If you just send a command, the memory controller refreshes it. Now, uh, the, the DRAM refreshes internally some rows. Now, you may say, why are we even sending the command? Why doesn't DRAM refresh it automatically, right? Any guesses? There's a reason for that, too. Well, because the interface between the memory controller and DRAM is not asynchronous. Meaning, memory controller really needs to know everything and schedule everything and know the latency of each operation. You cannot say, the DRAM, DRAM has no mechanism to say, oh, I'm busy, I'm not accepting a command right now. If the DRAM internally was refreshing itself, it has to have that mechanism today. But we don't have that today. As a result, the memory controller needs to periodically send the refresh command. So this has evolved in many ways. So for Raider to be implemented, you need to change this interface, right? Let's look at the, if, if you implement Raider in the memory controller, now you change this interface. What you need to do is you need to send the addresses and the refresh commands for those addresses. Now, the good thing is you're reducing refreshes significantly, so the addresses that you send hopefully will not consume more power. And this needs to be evaluated again, and the paper evaluates that. So the overhead is this if it's in the DRAM controller. So basically, you need additional commands issued per row refresh. But there's another possibility. Perhaps you do it in the DRAM chip, right? If you do it in the DRAM chip, then the overhead is even lower, and you don't need to send additional commands, right? But that requires some other changes to the interface, right? Which we're not going to talk about. So it's always good to think about these interfaces. And in my opinion, this interface between the memory controller and DRAM is one of the bigger limiters of innovation in this space, and people are trying to change that significantly. So 10 years from now, this interface will not be what you see today. That's why it's good to understand the implications of what's going on today. That's why you're taking this co course, hopefully. OK, so I'm going to skip this because I've already given you. OK, let me give you some more questions, and then we're going to move to one other example. So what else can you do to reduce the impact of refresh? This is going to be a big problem. An architect should think about this, perhaps. What else can you do if you know the retention time of the rows. How can you accurately measure the retention time of DRAM rows? And again, I'll recommend that paper over here. Uh, and these are all problems, actually. These are all very interesting problems. So basically, we will dig deeper more in this course. This is an example of digging deeper, right? And we haven't even dug deeper, I think, deep enough at the moment. There should be more uh, to be uncovered uh, over here. So if you have ideas, let me know. I'm always open to ideas. <laughs> OK, but making them work is oftentimes a real contrib contribution. <laughs> I, should, I should say that. OK, any questions? Is this fascinating? Yeah? Not so. <laughs> OK, it's fascinating for some. I hope it's fascinating. It's really fascinating to me, because this is actually things that we've discovered over the course of like six or seven years. Some of them were known, but not as well known, but now things are much well known. So let me give you another example. I'm, again, picking things from memory, because, again, this is a major bottleneck. We'll see more of other stuff later. So this is the Rovehammer problem. How many of you have heard about this, Rovehammer? Oh, cool. Where did you hear about this? Operating, Operating systems. Same? Yeah? Friend told me. OK, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> At least you know about it. Now you can protect your memory. <laughs> OK, so this is uh, another example of uh, knowing what's happening underneath. Right? Basically, this is a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And if you're interested in some other software people's opinion about this, uh, there, there's this Wired article that talks about forget software. Now hackers are ex exploiting physics to take over systems. And that they refer to, they talk about Rovehammer, basically. So the idea is, uh, I mean, this will not be news to you, maybe, because of uh, the fact that we talked about data dependence, right? Different cells affect each other, right? It turns out, when you repeatedly activate a row in a DRAM chip, 
you can cause errors in adjacent rows. And this is existent in today's DRAM chips. So let's take a look. So I've shown you activate earlier, right? Activate is opening a row, which places a row in the row buffer. It basically applies high voltage to that word line that we've seen. You apply high voltage, and that's how you read the data. Now, assuming that you want to read something else, you apply low voltage to it, you close the row. That's essentially writing back that I told you earlier when we talked about memory performance attacks. Now, if you're, let's say, malicious, you keep doing this over and over. Activate, pre-charge. It's called pre-charge, writing it back. Activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge, activate, pre-charge. It turns out, in most modern DRAM chips that you can buy in the field, the adjacent rows get corrupted. Some bits flip. Why? Because you're hammering. Well, there's a hopefully a better explanation than why you're, because you're hammering. But we call this the victim rows. Uh, and this is happening because things are too close to each other. Whenever you're applying a high voltage over here, there are multiple mechanisms over here, but I'll give you the most intuitive mechanism. It turns out, because things are so close to each other, you're not controlling things very well, you're not isolating things very well. There's little voltage that gets applied to this word line, and that little voltage affects all the cells in this row, and they get connected to the bit lines, and they lose a little bit of charge. And if you do it repeatedly, they lose a little bit of charge, a little bit of charge, a little bit of charge. And if you do it 50,000 times, they lose enough charge before they get refreshed. As a result, you lose the value. This doesn't happen in every cell. It happens in some cells that are vulnerable to this problem. And again, this is happening because things are too close to each other. There's electrical interference between the different cells. Data pattern dependence happens because of electrical interference also. This happens because of electrical interference as well. So uh, this is the paper, again, another paper that I'm going to assign you as a reading. But basically, we've discovered uh, through testing that more than 80% of the chips that we've tested exhibit this error problem. Now, this should not happen, right? Because this gets exposed directly to software, which we will talk about. Because some other, let's say, some operating system page could be in this victim row. Some other applications page could be in this row. Some, this, this, this applications page could be in this row. It, you don't know, actually. But some people have designed clever mechanisms to figure out what, what is in that row. And can we take over the system by doing this intelligently? OK, we've done these studies and showed that all companies are vulnerable. And actually, this is a scaling problem. Oh, this is going really fast. That's OK. So this is basically the manufacturing time of the DR module. This is the error rate. Rate is not that important. The fact that errors exist or not exist is the important thing over here. Basically, errors don't exist if the modules are older, because cells are actually farther away from each other. Electrical interference is not a, as big of a problem. Uh, but in 2010, this became apparently uncontrolled. And as a result, all of the modules that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 that we tested were vulnerable to these errors. So it's a failure mechanism. In a sense, it's nothing new. So if you, uh, we may cover flash memory in this course at some point, but uh, if you look at flash memory, the same thing happens in flash memory. The same thing happens in any memory technology, actually. It's really electrical interference in the end. Things are too close to each other, they interfere with each other. If you try to isolate them, you have to make them far away from each other, or you have to have some cost associated with it. But if you want to scale to higher densities, you'll run into this problem in any kind of memory technology. And hard disks have this problem. It's called the adjacent track interference. You read one track, you actually destroy data in other tracks. Flash memory has the same problem. You read one page, another page data gets destroyed. Of course, not destroyed completely, but some bits get flipped like this. The good thing in those memories is they have controllers that are correcting for these problems. You have a lot of error correction in hard disks. You have a lot of error correction in SSDs that protect things against these errors. But in DRAM, there's no error correction in these. <laughs> there's no error correction in that. In some server systems, people use ECC DIMMs. It's not built into the DRAM chip, but you have a separate DRAM chip that stores error correcting information, which could potentially correct a lot of these errors, but not all of them, according to the analysis in the paper. So DRAM is assumed to be perfect memory for a long time. That's one of the reasons why this became a big issue. Well, I think I've already said this, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Yes. OK. OK, you can read this. All of these slides will be available. But basically, everything I said over here, vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge. And if row hammer happens enough times, charge in such cells gets drained. Of course, this needs to happen enough times before the cells get refreshed. Right. 
So higher level implications. Basically, th there's enormous implications on upper layers of the transformation hierarchy. Basically, you have this problem over here, but it really affects the system security up there. And it affects the user in the end. So let me give you an example of why. You could actually download this code from our GitHub and run it on your computer and see if your memory is vulnerable. Uh, but basically, you can write the six-line code which uh, induces row hammer induced bit flips at the user level. So this is a user level code in x86. And what this code does is it intel intelligently selects addresses x and y. They map to the same bank. It avoids cache hits, flushes x from the cache. It avoids row hits. Remember the row buffer? You don't want things to be in the row buffer because you want to activate and precharge, activate and precharge. And to avoid row hits, you read x and y in a ping ponging manner. That's why you have the CL flushes and reading in this manner. And basically, this program, if it works, it does this. And if the chip is vulnerable, you'll get errors, hopefully. And we've tested some real chips. This is data from 2014. Basically, you get errors in different chips. There's nothing special about Intel and AMD. As long as you can access memory fast enough, you have a good memory controller, uh, you can sustain a good access rate such that you can induce row hammer before cells get refreshed, you get errors. Okay. So uh, it's actually even more scary about it. You can think about this as a reliability problem, but security implications are bigger because one can actually take over an otherwise secure system. So the paper you're going to read, the first sentence it starts with is memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. It's mind-boggling if this happens, right, if, it, if the programmer gets exposed to it. I still believe this. And actually, when we wrote this paper, we said that you could devise an attack that could take over the system by exploiting this. And while we were working on it, researchers from Google Project Zero wrote a beautiful blog post where they describe how they can take over the system by exploiting this DRAM row hammer bug. Now, they called the row hammer bug. I like the failure mechanism. I don't think it's a bug. It's really a failure mechanism that get ex gets exposed as a bug. But Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is directly from their blog post, which I will also recommend. I want to sign as a reading because it's a little bit long, but it's beautiful systems and security engineering. Uh, they basically said, uh, I'm quoting, test the selection of, they test the selection of laptops and found that a subset of them exhibited this problem, Rob Hammer problem. They built two working privilege escalation exploit that uses effect at the user level. One of them is not that interesting to me. Basically, it uses, it takes over the Google native client, okay? The second one is very interesting. As user level code, it takes over a Linux kernel, basically. You can, you can be root on Linux kernel. That's the idea. When you run uh, this code as unprivileged user land process. And the way it does it, again, I'm not going to go into the detail, uh, but because it's beautiful system security engineering, uh, but think about a page table entry. Think about a program uh, having a page table entry pointing to its own page table. You guys have studied virtual memory, right? How many of you do not know about virtual memory? Don't be shy again. I want to gauge. OK. Learn about virtual memory. <laughs> again, our digital systems course is a, a good one. But if you don't know about the concept, uh, then I would, I would suggest uh, that you go over the lectures or ask me so that I can point you to the right places, because some, uh, all of the material you may not be able to cover. But I have, uh, I have all my lectures online, so you can actually watch them and get a very good idea of that. But basically, you have uh, a page table entry that uh, points to your own page table, uh, and that page table entry determines your permissions on your page table. If you are able to induce bit flips in the page table entry, let's say the write enable bit to your own page table, if you are able to flip that bit such that you gain write access to your own page table, now you can write to any place in the system memory space, right? Now you compromise the system and you take over the system. That's essentially the gist of the attack. Now, they didn't do it with the write enable bits. They actually did much more clever things in this because one bit out of 64 bits or 32 bytes is huge, right? The, the, the likelihood of taking over the system is very low. So they actually opened a file, created, opened, opened a file many, many times. They created many, many page table entries and they were able to point, uh, induce bit flips in the address of the page table entry, and they were able to point to a location where they already have write enable access, and that location happened to be the page table. 
So that's the beauty of it. So they, they were able to point a page table entry where they already have write enable access to a page table by flipping a bit in the pointer, basically. So it's beautiful, you should read it. <laughs> so it was able to gain this uh, write access to its own page table and hence gain read write access to all of physical memory. Now it's a probabilistic attack. It doesn't always work also, of course, but later people like, can develop attacks. So this became famous as the row hammer vulnerability. And my favorite analogy is it's always good to have explanations that are really intuitive. It's basically like breaking into the apart uh, an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the perturbations that you cause because of that slamming open the door you were after. <laughs> That's essentially it, right? Somebody on Twitter actually had this beautiful insight. <laughs> Okay, so this is actually bigger than it is. Basically, uh, other people have shown in this paper somewhere, yeah, uh, where the, you can actually remotely induce these attacks. You can, uh, using uh, JavaScript, you can actually remotely hammer a server and gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors, which is interesting. Uh, and uh, this is my favorite, I think, actually. There's a recent paper that was in CCS, a secu top security conference where they showed that you could actually do this attack on an Android phone, on an ARM processor, and uh, they can actually gain control of a smartphone deterministically. What they were able to do in this uh, work was they figured out which parts of the memory were vulnerable to these rope hammer attacks, and they also figured out something interesting about the Android operating system. It's predictable in its memory, memory allocation patterns. So you can actually fool it to allocate a page table entry at a place that you want it to be allocated because of this predictable memory ac allocation patterns of the operating system. So they were able to fool the operating system to allocate a page table entry to, at a location where they knew they could hammer really well, and they hammered that location and they could deterministically gain access to the cell phone completely at, from the user level. And maybe there are other security implications in the end. This is another physical security implication, right? If, if your computer is getting hacked, maybe the best solution is this, <laughs> getting rid of it. <laughs> okay. So this is actually where we, uh, so by digging deeper, we've discovered Rovehammer, actually. I can tell you this story uh, later on. Uh, we have some time. So the reason we started looking into this was actually flash memory. We did a lot of research in flash memory, and flash memory has this read disturb problem. And we were also looking at retention time issues in DRAM that we've discussed earlier. So we said, why doesn't this happen in DRAM? Because DRAM has scaled a lot also. Why doesn't read disturb happen in DRAM? And we tested it with the infrastructure that we have, that I show over here, and voila. You see the re read disturb mechanisms in DRAM also. It's actually surprising. It shouldn't happen, but it's happened. Now you can also, also think about why did it happen, right? And it happens to the, it's an industry-wide problem. It's a scaling problem. So uh, manufacturers apparently didn't an anticipate it, right? So right now manufacturers are putting solutions to the problem, which I will briefly describe. ECC is one solution, adding error correcting codes, but it's a very heavy-handed solution. So as a computer architect, you should always evaluate the solution. Error correcting codes for every row, is that a good solution for this problem? It actually fixes a lot of the problems, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, why it doesn't? Because uh, ECC comes with various varieties, right? You can have a single error correcting, double error detecting code, which is less costly than four error correcting, five error detecting codes, right? So assuming you have a single error correcting, double error detecting code, can you correct all of the row hammer induced errors? Our results say no, because there are some cases where you get four errors in a cache block. So I'll give you a simpler solution. So how do we fix the problem? This, there's actually a variety of solutions. This is from the paper that you're going to read. You make better DRAM chips, good luck. <laughs> it's a better isolation. You need different materials, perhaps, but this comes at a cost. Refresh frequently, that's a reasonable solution, but we were trying to eliminate the refreshes anyway, right? <laughs> this goes against an optimization that we really want to do. So this has power and performance impact. Sophisticated error correction, we just talked about it. It comes with cost and power. Access counters, have access counters in the memory controller and try to detect that this is happening and throttle the accesses. I don't like that solution. It's not very elegant, but there are a lot of proposals out there because, again, how do you figure out which rows are frequently accessed? You need some hardware mechanism to figure this out. Or you can have access counters at the software level uh, by adding enough performance counters, but then there's software overheads to read those counters, right? So there, there's a huge solution space over here. So Apple's solution and a lot of the industry's solution in existing DRAM chips employed in the field is increasing the refresh rate because that's the only thing that makes sense and easy to do, doable. Basically, they said, uh, also known as Rowhammer exists, 
and leads to memory corruption. This issue was mitigated by increasing memory refresh rates. They don't say by how much. I don't know, maybe 2x, hopefully not 4x. But regardless, it's bad <laughs> because it affects your power and performance, right? So this is not a good solution. At least across the board, the increase of refresh rate is not uh, good. But they were nice because they referenced our paper also <laughs> in their security patch. Okay, so other people actually, not, not just APN, Leno, IBM, and others also release similar patches. So uh, let me give you a cheaper solution. If you understand the problem, what is a cheaper solution? Maybe it's not immediately implementable, but in the long term. So this was a solution that we proposed in the paper that you're going to read again. The idea is very simple. It's probabilistic. After closing a row, activates either both or one of its neighbors with very low probability. Five out of a thousand times you close a row. You do this. Now this gets rid of the problem, actually. This gives you a reliability guarantee that's much better than the reliability guarantee that you have for hard disks today. And by adjusting the value of this probability, you can provide arbitrarily strong protection. If you really want high reliability, you increase the probability. Of course, that comes at the cost of more refreshes that you need to do. But you refresh only the adjacent rows. You don't refresh across the board. And you refresh probabilistically. So you, you'll read the paper, you'll see that the performance impact of this is very low, about 0.2%. And the other benefit is there is no storage cost. You just need a random number generator. You, not even a perfect random number generator, in my opinion. In fact, it doesn't need to be even random, in my opinion, but that's okay. We can, we can, if you have ideas, we can talk about it. Okay, uh, so this gives you an example. If you understand the problem, you can develop customized solutions. And these customized solutions are always more efficient than across-the-board solutions like increasing the refresh rate, adding ECC. Uh, the problem is this customized solution is not implementable today because you need to modify something, right? This doesn't exist in existing systems. This is vulnerable to row hammer today. Well, I'm not going to be able to patch the memory controller to do this. Right? But going forward, DRAM chips are actually incorporating var variants of the solution. So I believe the solution will be fixed, uh, the problem will be fixed assuming they do the right thing in the DRAM chips. We'll see. <laughs> it remains to be seen. Okay, let me give you some thoughts. Basically, this is a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. How to exploit and fix the vulnerability requires a strong understanding across the transformation layers, right? I've started from the low level circuits and talked about security, right, here. And the solution is somewhere in between. It's not in the low level circuits, really because that's very costly. That's, the, that's why the problem is happening in the first place. But it's in the architecture level somewhere. And I've given you an overview of some other solution. And a strong understanding of the tools available to you, right? So uh, their fixing needs to happen for two types of chips, actually. Let me uh, talk about this. Again, as an architect, you need to consider both, perhaps. Existing chips that are already in the field and future chips. And I think I've given you two different solutions. Existing chips, Apple's solution is not bad, because that's the only thing you can do. But future chips you can do better. And mechanisms for fixing are different between the two types. So let me give you an aside over here. This is actually uh, a class of failures called Byzantine failures. Have you ever heard about Byzantine failures? Yes? Looks like you have. You have. How many, how many people have? Where, in operating systems? Distributed systems. Oh, cool. Who taught that course? <laughs> Okay, awesome. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know both of them well. Well, yeah, this is a Byzantine failure. It's the Byzantine generals problem, their famous problem uh, that talks about it. If you read it, uh, you'll know about it. But basically, these failures are characterized by undetected erroneous computation like this. It's basically the opposite of fail fast. Fail fast is a good system design principle. You fail fast with an error or no result. <laughs> you say, I have a problem, right? <laughs> or you don't give out the result. As it stands, the hammer leads to silent data corruption, right, which is erroneous computation. Erroneous can be malicious. The only distinction is really the intent. Right? If you detect a Byzantine failure, you can absolutely say somebody's going to exploit it at some point. And it's very difficult to detect and confine the sort of Byzantine failures. Basically, the solution is do all you can to avoid them. <laughs> that's a very good system design principle. If you can avoid them, that's good. That's why we have a problem today. And this is the paper. If you're interested, uh, this is by Leslie Lamport, another Turing Award winner, uh, that introduces the Byzantine generals problem and talks about the Byzantine failures. It's beautiful. Have you read this paper also in distributed systems? 
No? OK. Now you have an opportunity to re read it. <laughs> OK, so more on Rohammer. If you can take a look at these references, but uh, this is one potential reading for your homework one assignment. I haven't decided yet how many readings I should assign, but we'll see. And actually, this is something that I will probably assign at some point. Basically, it's a more of a retrospective and future-looking, very short paper, six pages, that talks about uh, some of the other issues that we may face as memory becomes denser and higher capacity and more problematic. So let me uh, t give you some takeaways. I think all of these point to the fact that we're at an exciting time to be understanding and designing computing platforms. There are a lot of open issues, and there are a lot, a lot of discoveries to be made. Uh, this is because we have many challenging and exciting problems in platform design because we're really pushing the cutting edge. So if you look at this, this is really pushing the cutting edge today. Uh, actually, some of the most interesting processors are inside this right now. And uh, we are seeing problems that no one has tackled or even thought about before. Rohammer is one example, at least at the DRAM level. Right? And that can have huge impact on the world's future as well. Data centers, we, de we, even, we didn't have, uh, haven't talked about that. And this is all driven by huge hunger for data. I don't like the word big data, but OK, called big data. New applications, even greater realism, dot, 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 right? And we can easily collect more data than we can analyze and understand. So we really need to s have the platforms to support that analysis, storage, computation, whatever it is that's needed. And there, there's two things that's driving. That's something is driving from the top. You should look at the top, right? Also the bottom. There's something really interesting things that, that are happening at the bottom. There are significant difficulties in keeping up with that hunger at the technology level. This example that I gave you at the DRAM level is an example. And also, people are looking at things like non-volatile memory, for example. Can we enable them because of those significant difficulties? And energy, reliability, and complexity have become big problems. Uh, again, walls is another term that people use. Uh, so let me give you a couple more slides, and then we'll, do we'll be done. <laughs> So basically, we have increasingly demanding applications. I don't need to list all of them, but dream and they will come, and they come, always. <laughs> people have always had this uh, debate. Like even early in the 1980s, people said, why do, why do we need anything more powerful than an, an, a MIPS R2000? If you look at MIPS R2000, it's a very wimpy processor. Well, clearly we need something because people actually do something with that high performance. So applications will always come, in my opinion. That's limited by the creativity of the people. And as long as that doesn't end, <laughs> we're going to have them. But also, there's increasingly diverging complex trade-offs that are happening in the system today. I'll give you one example over here. That was not true in the past. So 70 years ago, when von Neumann model was designed, computation was much more expensive than a memory access. Today, this picture that I borrow from uh, Bill Daly's Hypi keynote, it shows that Let's focus on a 64-bit double-precision floating-point operation. It consumes 20 picojoules. A DRAM access, almost three orders of magnitude, much more energy-hungry. So given this trend, we have a very different trade-off space now. Von Neumann model says instruction gets fetched. You need to fetch the data, bring it from memory, process it in the processor, write the result back to memory. Now, if you don't have good locality, does it make sense to do that? Maybe not, right? Because you're consuming 1,000x three times to do a 20 picojoules operation. Maybe a much more interesting design choice is actually sending the computation to the data. And the, some compute unit or something does that computation without moving the data. So today, data movement is much more energy hungry than computation. And this is, again, this is a very changing trend. If you look at 70 years ago, the trend was the opposite. Of course, data is hard to come by, but uh, a, 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 an operation like this was two orders of magnitude more energy hungry than a memory access at that time. And we've designed the paradigms based on that. But the paradigm may need to change today. Right? And the complex systems are increasingly complex. This is a past system, but today's systems look much more complicated. Right? You actually have a lot of accelerators. This thing over here has lots of accelerators. You have machine learning accelerators. You have other things. You have vision accelerators. You have, I don't know, whatever. Um, you have GPUs. You have FPGAs, reconfigurable logic that people are putting. And some of them may be on chip also. Uh, things are becoming much more heterogeneous on the memory side. There are different types of memories, which we will talk about. Maybe persistent memory. There are certainly SSDs. So things are much more complex today also. So 
I think I will end with this slide. But basically, uh, this course will hopefully cover a lot of material to enable you to understand how a computing platform works, how decisions made in hardware affect the software programmer, as well as the hardware designer. Think critically. I think if you don't take away anything, this is the most important thing. Uh, but think broadly across the levels of transformation. Understand how to analyze and make trade-offs in the design. And apply the above, do the above in several design slash research projects and homeworks. That's not hardware's homeworks. <laughs> There's an aliasing problem over here. Uh, hopefully th those things will be designed to enable you to, uh, or teach, enable, empower you to do all of that. Well, I've introduced myself at the end, I guess. So let me briefly introduce the course staff, so if you give me one more minute. Uh, so basically, if you didn't know already, uh, I'm a professor here since officially September 2015, but I really started in 2016. Before that, I was a Strecker professor at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I still have a position there. I still have a group there, which is hopefully reducing over time so that I don't need to travel to Pittsburgh. But whenever I travel to Pittsburgh, I should see falling water. <laughs> and I got my PhD from UT Austin uh, some number of years ago. Worked a lot at Intel and AMD through internships and consulting in various positions, and also worked, started the computer architecture group at Microsoft Research. That's why you saw that paper that was written while I was at Microsoft Research. And also worked at Google and VMware and consulted for some other companies who shall remain nameless over there, perhaps. Uh, and you should definitely uh, email me. And actually, that's going to be one of your assignments, but not today. Uh, and if you use my Gmail address, you'll see that response time will be better because I like that interface much better. I still haven't figured out how to export my interface, Gmail interface, to my ETH address. Uh, and my website is over there. I'm, I'll have office hours, but those are to be determined. And I do research and teaching, well, clearly in computer architecture, but computer systems, bioinformatics, and I've shown you examples of memory systems. We do hardware security, fault tolerance, hardware software cooperation, but a lot of other stuff like GPUs, interconnects, dot, dot, dot. If you're interested, you can look at the web page or ask me. But we have teaching assistants also. Uh, not all of them are here. Hassan is a PhD student with me, whose work you will see later sometime in this course. Juan is over here. He can show himself. He just joined. He's a postdoc with me. Mohammed is over here. He's a PhD student with me, also an academic guest. And Arash, who's not here, he's also a postdoc with me. I think Irish is still sick, right? And we have some other uh, folks here. Louise over here, for example. Uh, but he will be gone by the time this course ends, I think, or something like that. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe we'll put you as an official assistant over here. <laughs> and Yahua as well. OK, so I get to know them and their research. They will help you through the projects uh, as well. OK, I think I'm done. Any burning questions? All right, I'll see you tomorrow.